welcome everyone to tonight's episode of Profound States. Tonight we have a very special guest. His name is Don Anderson. He was born in Glendale, California in 59. Uh, very early in life, he moved to a rural farming community in Utah, where his mother and younger brother lived for a good part of his life after his father passed away. He always believed the homes he lived in were haunted, only to discover they were not a result of spirit haunting. But numerous abduction and contact experiences, which only increased in frequency and intensity as he grew older. Then one night in the summer of 84, as a single parent himself to a younger boy, they both were taken from the room and carried through a beam onto a craft which was floating in the air across the street from their home. When he was placed back in his bed after, event, after the event, he immediately had an instant recall of a lifetime of part uh, of past contact experiences which in included watching himself being escorted into the delivery room where he was being born with a gray being who was reminded, who was reminding him to not forget who he was. The experiences continued through his life on a shamanic level, as well as being a contactee with remembered experiences. These experiences include times where he was told not to talk about the subject of alien contact, followed up by a military abduction experience and a real-time contact experience involving a race of beings referred to as the praying mantis, with three others in the high country of Utah, not too far from the Skinwalker Ranch. As a public speaker, he has spoken to audiences throughout the western states of Idaho, Utah, Oregon, and Washington about his experiences and the impact they have had on his life, as well as the Area 51 conference, which was held in Rachel, Nevada at the time. Also recent interviews with authors and researchers, Grant Cameron and Preston Denon, as well as recent schools with the Discovery Channel. Um, I'm gonna stop here. Uh, welcome to tonight's show, Don Anderson. How are you doing this evening? Oh, thanks so much for having me, Charles. I'm doing actually pretty well, and thanks for inviting me on to talk to your audience. Um, why don't we jump right into it? Uh, let's try to go in chronological order, even though that wasn't how you discovered it. Uh, what was the very first event in your life? I guess that was being delivered by Gray? Uh, yeah, I was, it was before I was even born. Um, <clears throat> my memory goes back to watching my mother on the delivery table in the hospital, in the delivery room in the hospital, about ready to give birth to me. I, I can remember looking, I was up like in the corner of the room with a Gray. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we were looking down on the scene, and he was communicating with me. He wasn't talking; he was just communicating. This this gray seems to be like this little character that's followed me through life. It's kind of like a, a teacher or a mentor. I guess be more like a mentor to me. <clears throat> and um, so we were sitting up there, and we were just talking communicating back and forth and he was telling me to remember who I was and sort of giving a breakdown of how the connection with the human body works so that I would have an understanding of or he wanted me to remember later on in life how that connection works so it and it gets a little complicated that way but <clears throat> excuse me got a frog in my throat but what he was actually talking to me about was how the structure of the DNA works in connection with the cells. And the cells being like you have a conscious self, which is the physical body. You know, if you have the physical body, it's just a human. It, it, it's just an animal, basically, if you take away the spirit out of it. And so he was saying that the physical body carries your DNA through generational life. OK, and what he's saying is like from your parents to your grandparents to to your ancestors to the ancestral line, your DNA carries all the memories of everybody who's lived before you. OK, and if you died at that point, that would be it. There would be nothing. And he was saying it. This secondary state of being is the uh, spirit self what you call the unconscious self, because people aren't aware that it's there, I guess. And uh, it's the thing that carries all 
your connections throughout time and space throughout all your existences is exists in the DNA of the spirit self as it enters into the body. So that's where you get your past lives and that's where you get your lives on other planets and your diseases and all that kind of stuff that comes through with the spiritual DNA. And so when it connects with the physical body, uh, it gives it life and that's where your life starts connecting. And as a result of that, because there's information from your spirit self, your unconscious self, that's trying to connect with the conscious self, there needs to be developed a, uh, how would I say it, a third self, which I call the subconscious self. The subconscious self acts like a third body and it kind of filters information in from the two so that you don't get overloaded as a visible being. Okay, so it only allows what you are capable of understanding due to your belief structure and the teachings that you've taught, been taught in this lifetime. It doesn't want to overwhelm you. So the subconscious self develops this filter, lets the information back and forth. And it also, unfortunately, leads to a lot of the illnesses and mental illnesses and stuff like that that happens on the planet. So he was saying, this is how the human body works and how it connects with the universe. And the eventual goal that you want to do is to eliminate the subconscious self and allow the unconscious self to assimilate into the physical body fully. And if it does that, then you are an awakened soul, so to speak. Okay, and you're not working through the subconscious self anymore, which is the goal what Christ, if you believe in Christ, it's kind of the goal that he is teaching in overcoming the selves. You know, that's kind of what he was teaching. So he was he was giving me that information and kind of been planning it in for me and saying, don't forget about this. This is how it works. And uh, I'll be around. And we're not forgetting about you, but you're going to be born here now. And then he leaves and I was actually born. Now. So what did he look like and did he have a name? He was your typical gray and, the, you know, like he would have the three, like three feet tall, but he wasn't the biological type. Now, there's a couple different, there's a whole myriad of different types of gray beings. Okay. It's not just right. one, right. Little, you know, I think right. everybody's familiar with that. And he was a living entity. He wasn't a biological computer, as I like to call him. And he was just your typical gray, long skinny arms, three fingers, one opposing thumb. Short, tall, had a name. Short, he was like about three feet tall. I don't know for sure what his name was. I've never, that's the whole thing. Most of the time I never ask for names. You just kind of recognize this being. So so, I, so did he look like the creature, the lay, the female on Willie's uh, communion book or did he look very different? Um... He was a little stockier, I would say, you know, had a little bit more of a human characteristic to him. But uh, he was still very much a gray, you know. It's, okay. Yeah. So go forward. Uh, when you were born, did, did you have a connection at your birth itself? I am not aware of. Then it gets kind of hazy up to about the age of three years old. Uh, you know, it's. So, okay, so before you go forward, so um, looking back at the gray who was talking to you before you were born, mm -hmm. do, you, do you believe that the grays have a, um, are they beyond um, physical reality, beyond time and space sort of thing? Because remember, he's on the other side speaking to you yeah so, he is on the other side which is kind of a dilemma on this whole thing too you know because uh, i don't believe he was probably an interdimensional being is what i'm thinking okay okay um now there's a lot of different kinds of interpretation of interdimensional beings i mean you got your angel types you got your demon types you got your ghosts you got your grays you got the <laughs> alien beings and and they're just a lot of it, it's very convoluted I think if you try to nail it down and put it in a box, you're just going to get lost with the whole thing because it, it doesn't work that way. Well, did you, you know, did, does it, <clears throat> see the same uh, being that you encountered over and over and over through your life? Yeah, definitely. 
Yes. And in your life, did he look the same as he did before you were born? Yep. He was just the same type of being and the same. Okay, people. we'll go forward then to your next event that you remember. This next event is not actually an ET event, which is kind of strange, but it's like uh, me being communicating in the other side of the veil type of thing. So my father died at a very young age when I was three. Okay, he was diagnosed with cancer, and that was back in '62. And they didn't have anything they could do with him at the time. They said, so they said, why don't you just go home and finish your time out with your family? Yeah. And so he came home. He was in one room. And I was sitting in the room next to him, laying in bed, and my aunt was kind of watching over me. And I actually stood, I actually sat up in bed out of a deep sleep the moment he died, and I was communicating with him. And uh, I was nodding my head back and forth. I said, yeah, dad, yeah, dad. He says, okay, now I've got to go. And I says, well, where are you going? He says, well, I just got to go now because it's my time here is done with you guys. But I want to understand I'm going to be around and that uh, I love you very much. And I, ex I, w I expect that you're going to be able to take care of your mother when you get older. OK, and he was kind of just saying goodbye to me at that time. You know, so I just stood right up out of bed. I was talking to him and, you know, communicating with him. My aunt was looking Did at you me kind of. Could yeah. you see, could you see an image of him when you were talking yeah. to him? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. And did, in the image, did, it was the image inside your head, right? I uh, know he was a, well, kind of inside my head, but he was like uh, just standing at the other side of the room. And my aunt. Okay, so you see could him, see him outside outside your head. Yeah, I could see him outside my head. And so he, I was, did he look solid or two dimensional, three dimensional? What did he look like? As I remember, he looked fairly solid. You know, I mean, I, I wasn't looking through him. I was looking like I was looking at him. But My he aunt, who you could see him as three dimensional. He was three yeah. dimensional. Yeah. A lot of yeah. times you see spirits, they're two dimensional. They're like yeah. flat. There's no depth. They're solid, but not, but, but they're only two dimensional instead of three dimensional. Yeah, he looked like he had depth to him. I mean, it looked like he was standing in the room with me. And, uh, at okay. that very moment, he had died in the other room, so he just came straight to me and says, hey, you know, I'm, I've got to go. So so did it bother you very much at that moment? No, I just said, OK, Daddy, bye. And I turned back over. I went to sleep. How old, and, were, you? Uh, How old were you at the time? I was three at the time. Wow. Yep. And uh, OK, so I don't want to dwell too much on your father's passing because that's always traumatic regardless. Mm -hmm. uh, go to the next event that happened to you. Okay, we're going to jump ahead a few years here now. I was like, uh, I was like maybe 10 or 11 years old. And this was, no, let's back up here. I'll go back to about five years old, okay? Because this is pretty intense. This gets pretty intense, okay? I was five years old, and we were living in a little tiny town, and my mom was a single parent. She had just moved from California to Utah. And that's where we were, that's where I spent a big portion of my life. And um, I can remember it all started when one night there was a light that was shining through my bedroom window. And uh, at the time before, now I'm going to preface this and say, you know, when I was 24, this was all revealed to me. So we're backspacing here a little bit. I just want you to know that at sure, the time, that's fine. At the time, I thought uh, there was a man standing outside the window, and he was shining a flashlight in the window. But what I really came to understand that there was a beam that was shining through the window, and when that beam shone through the window, I knew at that point that there was this gray troll-like beam that was going to walk through the walls, and he was going to come in to get me. And it terrified me. It just absolutely terrified me. I can remember sitting up in the corner. We had bunk beds. My brother was sleeping on the top bed, and I was down on the bottom. And I can remember just sitting in the corner, pulling the covers up around me, and just trembling with fear as I watched this gray troll-like being walking through the wall. Now, if you've ever seen communion, there's a point in communion. I've talked a little bit about this to Whitley about this as well, just briefly. It wasn't very anything really big, but. I talked something about Whitley Strieber on this, where he, in the movie, there's a point where 
Christopher Walken, who actually plays him, meets up with this little gray, this little troll-like being, and he's doing a little dance for him. And they're kind of dancing together. And it looked very, very similar to that kind of being that Christopher Walken was dancing you say with. Troll like you talking about the short blue guys? No, these were short little ape looking like guys. Okay. They were squatty, they had long arms, they had wide mouth with really real big teeth. They had big bug eyes on them, and it looked like they had kind of almost like warts over the body of some sort. You know, it was like I said, were, you see, you they, see were gray. they were grays. No, these were totally different creatures altogether. These were not grays. They were kind so of an ape. What do you call them? I don't short know. Ape, short ape looking creatures. Yeah, that's that's about it. Like I said, if you've seen the movie Communion, it looked very, very similar to the one he, that was in the movie. OK, they weren't grays. They, they were just had a little type of. They're different species altogether. OK, uh, how did that go through that encounter? OK, this happened all summer long and it terrified me, but every time it would be the same thing. And so these little troll like, <coughs> excuse me, my voice is going out of me. These little troll like beans would walk up to me. They'd just kind of waddle through the floor, through the wall, over the floor. And walk up to me he would smile and he would stick his finger up under me underneath my arm and try to tickle me and i wasn't i wasn't having any it wasn't funny I, yeah, he was trying his best to put me at ease and I, it wasn't working but i was just terrified you know and then he would scoop me up in his arms and would waddle across the floor back into the wall and would go up into this light into a ship. And this happened all summer. It was. Do you remember anything about what happened in the ship? Oh, yeah. It's. Um, what happened to him? I don't know. It's. it's he just kind of left the picture. It was like he was the guy who was coming in to get me. So I don't remember anything after that about that particular species. But I do remember being with the gray again, my gray. The little gray mentor. So you you don't remember ever being in a ship with the small ape like looking things? No, not the small ape like looking ones. Okay, so go to your. So you don't remember being in the ship with him once once he took you in the yeah. ship? No, you don't remember no. that. Okay, so I, 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 if I went into hypnosis, I would probably remember. Probably, I could probably uh, backtrack it, but I've never been to hypnosis for any of these events that happened up to that point of 24 years old. Well, if you ever want to do that, let me know. OK. Uh, so uh, go to your next event. OK. When we're sitting on the ship, the gray would be with me. No, no. Okay. Uh, what, OK, so you're jumping to another onboard. No, this is the same thing. This is the same event. He would take me, he would put me on the ship, and then meet up with the gray. Oh, so it's the same event. How old were you? Yeah, same event. Uh, five. Five. Okay, yeah. so you're on the board with a gray. The the ape looking creature got you, took you on the ship. Now you're with a gray at the age of five on the ship. Yep. And, okay. Uh, go ahead. The gray is actually sitting maybe about. Well, we were both standing on the ship. He's like ten feet away. And we were playing an energy game, is what I would refer to it as, because he knew I kind of like sports. I guess I don't know, but. He had this round plasma ball and he would hold it in his hands. And he would just energetically, he would shoot it to me. He wouldn't move his hands. It would just like, you know, something with his mind, he would shoot it to me. He would say, catch the ball. And I'd be standing over on the other side, I'd catch the ball and it would have this tingly little electrical feel to it. This happens a lot. I don't know what it is, but tingly electrical feel to it. And he said, now toss it back. And at first I tried to just toss it to him. And he said, no, 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 you do it with your mind. And so we would practice doing these energy things until I got to the point where I could actually project that ball across to him without using my hands or my arms. It was just using a mental type of a thing. So you were able to do it? So we, after a time, we were able to do it, yeah. How long did it take you to learn? Oh, I've, 
it must have taken me probably about all summer. I mean, it was this was going on for a good month. There's a lot that was going on that, uh, I mean, it was just, the whole event was tripping my biological mom out and she was beyond means about what to do. I mean, she'd call the police because she'd they hear that, that there was somebody outside. I would tell her somebody's outside with a flashlight shining through the window. So she'd call the police and they would do a stakeout and they never could find anything. And they'd walk around the room, that, I mean, the lawn the next day after it had been watered, try to find footprints or anything. They never ever found anything. There's nothing there that they could find, but it would keep going on night after night after night. And uh, this, at first, up to the age of 24, I thought the house was haunted because this keep, kept happening. And the police couldn't find anything to do about it. In fact, she got so freaked out over it that, uh, and I didn't find this out till you know, like 20 years later, but she would, back in the day, you would put the clothes out on the line to dry. You know, that was her way of doing it. She didn't have a dryer. She couldn't afford a dryer. So she'd put the clothes out on the line. The next morning, she'd wake up and they'd be folded on the back porch for her. So somebody had been taking the clothes off the line, folding them up, putting them on the back porch, and she'd walk out the next morning and they'd be sitting there folded. And it was like, there's nobody who ever entered into that backyard. They couldn't find any reason on why this would be happening. And um, so they would put me back. And at the end of the summer, I can remember the gray saying, don't go in the basement, the ghosts are down there. And so I was just scared to death that, you know, something was gonna get me if I went down the basement. So I was terrified of the basement. In fact, my mom would used to say, hey, you know, she bought a dryer, she broke down and bought a dryer because she didn't want to go out and hang the clothes on the line anymore. So she brought it, bought a dryer and she would say, Donald, go down and get the clothes out of the dryer. I said, no, I'm not going downstairs. And she'd get just furious at me. She would say, no, you got to know the, the ghosts are downstairs. I can't go downstairs. The ghosts are there, right? <laughs> and uh, it, so she gave up on that. And after a while, I, you know, we had a really slick floor in the kitchen. The kitchen would go right to the back door. And then there's a little stair, step right there. And then you could walk down to the basement. Okay, so I was sliding across the floor in my socks. And I slipped and I fell. And I tumbled down the stairs and I got all the way down the stairs and smacked my head on a plaster wall that was down on the bottom of the stairs. It wasn't drywall, it was plaster. That's what they were using back then, the plaster. And it put a dent in the plaster and my head was really bleeding and there was just blood flowing down my shirt. And uh, I just screamed. And it wasn't because I was in pain or because I was bleeding, but it was because the ghosts were going to get me. And what I came to find out later was that there's some sort of portal in the basement. And they were kind of worried about me being young and stepping through the portal, and then they wouldn't be able to find me. I'd get lost in there somewhere. You know, so that's why they told me, hey, stay out of the basement. We don't want you getting lost. The ghosts are down there. They're going to get you, you know, type of so thing. How did so. you find out about the portal? The same time when um, I had that little awakening experience. There's a lot of information that was revealed to me when I was 24 and I had that experience. It was just like, wow, you know, I didn't, some of the stuff I never had a clue was going on. Yeah. You know, and uh, it was that. So then uh, we moved from that house and we took a temporary residence down in a little tiny. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Before you, yeah. before you go beyond the house. Uh, yeah. Go back to the portal. How did you, uh, did you ever actually see the portal or encounter it in some fashion? No, I never did. They just told me that uh, the ghosts were downstairs because they didn't want me to go into the portal. I never actually remember being into the portal. Now it could have been that they walked me back through the portal to drop me off a couple times and that would made would have made a lot of sense because so how, how did you come to understand the portal was there it was a remembered thing that oh yeah i remember that portal being there and that's why they told me this thing because uh it's just like this flashback like like i would, we'll get into this later i'm sure but 
Uh, when I was 24, I had an experience and there was instantaneous life flashback to all these events that had happened up to that point in time. And all these little things that were associated with it was like, oh, well, that's kind of cool, you know. But this was actually one of those events I didn't even remember. I just thought it was a haunted house up till the age of 24. So at the age of 24, you you had a regression that showed you that the that you had some encounters with the portal. No, it wasn't a regression. It was an experience. Okay. Uh, it was an so abduction experience. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's save that for later. Uh, okay. What is the next event that you uh, remember that you had? Okay. Whatever was going on in that house continued on to this little Indian community. I mean, it was an American Indian community, basically, in southern Utah. They had maybe 20 or 30 people living there. And my stepfather was in the construction industry. That's, he met up with my mom at that time. And uh, so they decided to move us down to southern Utah because I was close to the road construction project that he was working on. Right. So we move in this house and immediately there's some weird stuff that starts going on, which I I don't know if this is haunting. I don't know what was going on down there, but so um, yeah. it was, was just out just was just maybe a few months after I started having these experiences. In so you're room. still five? Uh, yeah, I'm still five. Go yeah. ahead. And we moved down there and um, it's an old, old house. It's like built back in like the 1850s or something like that, a really old house. And my stepfather decided, you know, hey, one night we're, you know, after dinner, uh, he says, hey, let's take a road, little road trip out here. I'll show you some of the old Indian ruins or whatever, you know, out there. And uh, we'll go jackrabbit hunting. Not kill anything, but just show us where the jackrabbits were and where they were at. And so it got to be dark and we head home and we get home and my mom is locked up in the car. OK, um, she says, I'm not going back in that house. I am not going back in the house. There's somebody there in that house watching me. And everybody just got it. He just got a poo poo to subject, you know, so. A week later, we go out again on a ride. And we take off and turn off all the lights and lock the doors and we take off, we come back, and every light in the house is on. The radio that usually sits on the table was hanging by the cord on the floor, full blast. It was just going full blast, and the water was running in the sink. Everything was on, and nobody was in the house. The doors hadn't been locked. There was nothing that we could find. Nobody had entered in there. So your mom was with you when you left? That second time, yeah, she was with us. She wasn't going to stay in the house by herself. Okay. And uh, so whatever had happened in this other town that we were living in, followed us. It was, I don't know if it was just messing with our heads or whatever, but it was really kind of spooky. So needless to say, we moved out of that place really fast into a house that they'd built up there. And that kind of haunting just kind of followed us, too. It's like... A, You'd hear steps, up, you know, living in that house up there, you'd hear people running up and down the stairs and doors shutting and there'd be nobody there. Yeah, so it followed us, especially in the older years when I moved back in with her for a little while. After I was a single parent, I moved back in with her for a little while. There's a lot of weird stuff that went on. But uh, that pretty much ended that period of time and things just kind of got normal. Oh, I will <clears throat> say this. When we were living in that little town, um, we used to, I used, I all of a sudden I started coming down with these sinus infections really bad. And they this, used to. This is in Utah, right? This is in Utah, yep. And at that same age, I'd come down with these sinus problems really bad, okay? And I keep getting these sinus infections. And uh, so finally, my mom took me into the doctor because they weren't going away. And she takes me into my doctor, who I've been in like three or four times before. You know, he had this little drawer down there and he'd say, OK, go get you something out of the drawer. You've been a good boy, you know. And we'd get little toy soldiers or things of that nature he'd give us for being 
get kids. Well, this time I go walking in the ha- in the doctor's office and he does a little exam. He says, okay, yeah, we're going to have to give you a shot this time because we're going to see if we get rid of those infections that you've been having, right? And I'm sitting there. I've had shots before, you know, preschool shots. So I'm sitting there. She comes walking into the room and I look at that needle and I just scream a bloody terror and I fly down the hallway and I jump out in the car and I lock the car doors and I'm sitting clear in the back, just trembling and crying. And they're sitting out on the outside of the car. I say, Don, let us in, let us in. What's wrong? Let us in, you know. There's something about that shot that just terrified me. And it was, there was a period of time there where I'm pretty sure, again, this is, I'd have to go back and get some hypnosis on this one, but I was being taken on the ships and they were doing something with a needle about that time as well. I know that, but I don't know for sure what it is. I've blocked that out. It's, And it started about that period of time. And so I saw the needle and I just freaked. I just, oh, no way, man. You can't, you can't do that, you know. It brought back vision of something going on because the nurse shows up. She's dressed in her white gown. You know, back in the days they did that. It was... White was the standard thing, and they had their little caps on and everything. And uh, said, "Well, we'll just have to give them some pills because there's no way we're giving them shots." And ever since, from that point forward, I was terrified of going to having that shot. You know, it just was. Especially one year, he took me in and tried to give me a shot in my nose for uh, uh, sinus infection, not sinus, but allergies. You know, he said, "Yeah, we got this new procedure. We'll just give him a shot, numb the nose, and give him a shot in the nose." And they literally had a fight to keep me in the chair. I was not because it, it brought back memories of something. Yeah, and uh, so something went on that way that was not so good that I'm not remembering or I've blocked out that. Yeah, sure. Then. Yeah. Cool. So that was pretty much that summer. That's pretty so, wild. What's the next thing you remember? The next thing we'll go on, this is probably, like I said, the 10 or 12 years old happening. There's a, I was meeting with, I had a couple friends that lived a couple streets down from us. I mean, not a couple streets, but a couple houses down from us. And uh, we would get together every once in a while, we'd have a sleep out on the front yard. And there's a meteor shower that's going on and during this media shower, we decided, well, it's supposed to be at midnight tonight. Let's go out on the front lawn. We'll have a sleep out, sleep over, and we'll watch the stars, you know, and we'll see what's going on. So me, my little brother, and my two friends from down the street, they, they're both brothers. We get together, and we have a sleep out out front. And come about, you know, one in the morning, everybody starts nodding off. And I hear something after everybody's nodding off, I hear something and I turn over and I see the younger brother to my friend just piling grass on top of his face. And I'm looking at, you know, it's a typical jokes or something that he would do all the time, you know. I said, hey, what are you doing? And he says, he's not listening. He, I can't wake him up. He says, look, you know, so he leans down next to his ear and just screams his brother's name in his ear loud as you can you can hear all of it down the block and neither him or my brother wake up and there are no lights turn on the house nothing's going on everything is just dead and looking back on it it everything was like we were kind of in a vacuum at the point you know you couldn't hear any crickets you couldn't hear any dogs barking or anything like that it was just me and him talking to each other and making fun of his brother so he's now at this point he's screaming in his ear and he's not waking up and he's got grass covered all over his face and we said oh that's weird let me try that with my brother i tried with my brother he wasn't waking up and so we said oh we're awake now let's just walk down to my house and which is like i said two or three houses down the block and we'll get an apple so I said, sure, man. So we walked down his house, walked down his house. The doors are open in the houses out there because it was a country. There were maybe 200 people lived in that vicinity, you know, and there's lots of dogs and cats and that kind of stuff around there. So we walked down to his house 
and when we're walking to his house, we give the apple, we open the door, yelling in the house, nobody's answering, nobody's coming to the door, nothing. So we're sitting on the front porch eating an apple. Now, at his house, and we're just talking back and forth, at his house, if you look forward out in front of the house where we're sitting, go staring straight forward, there's like a maybe a 15 foot lawn and then there's an irrigation ditch in front of it and then there's a dirt road and then there's some orchards not some orchards but some alfalfa fields out in front of us you know and some power lines up there above us so um and we're sitting there talking and all of a sudden we look up in the sky and it looks like there's a firework show or something going on we see these orange plasma like balls just shoot through the sky they start from one particular spot and then they just shoot through the sky. And we say, we're looking at it loud and they go, oh, that's cool. Somebody must be lighting some fireworks or something off because it wasn't too far from the 4th of July, you know. Like somebody's lighting fireworks off, well, that's cool. So we're sitting there watching it and this little light show starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And now there's like these orbs flying all over the place and they're just, it's just this fantastic light show we're watching. <clears throat> and um, as we're watching it, all of a sudden we could see this ship, this this edge of a ship kind of comes through the end. Of, it's hard to know it, where it's coming from, but it just starts coming from the sky. You open the sky, you see this little edge of a ship pointing through. And it's like if you're lying flat on the water and you see something slowly come up from the water, it was the same thing, but it was up in the air, up above us. And you can see the ship slowly start poking through, and then this fireworks display stops. And there's no more fireworks. And we're both just staring at this thing slowly emerging from the sky. It was just like it was coming out of nowhere. And we look as it fully emerges, and there's the ship. It's just this UFO is just sitting out in front of us, above the field in front of the house, and we don't, we're both kind of freaked out at this point. We're looking out saying, what the hell, you know? And you can see this beam come down and this little gray being is in it. And he looks at me and I look at him and he says, run, hide. And so we both take off into the house, you know, and lock the door behind us, but there's still the screen door that we can see through. And, uh, I run straight to his dad's room. And I can remember walking around the bed, shaking his dad, trying to get his dad up. He didn't, you no, know, my friend didn't come with me, but I'm just shaking him. And you can see the light shining through the bedroom window. So there must be something behind us as well. There's a light shining through the bedroom window. I could see him and his wife lying right next to each other. And I'm shaking him, saying, Get up, get up, get up. You got to get up. There's something here. You got to get up. You got to get up. And he's not moving. He's not opening his eyes. It's just like he's dead. I walk around the room and I'm trying to shake it. And I say, get up, get up. And she's not getting up either. So I run back into the living room, down the hallway, back into the living room. And I'm asked, I, I yell my friend's name. Out. I said, Blaine, where are you? Where are you? And I look over in the corner. He's hiding behind the TV. The TV stand that's back there in the corner. And he says, hide, hide, man, hide. Get out of here, hide. And so I jump, I dive behind a chair that's sitting between me and the window, and I'm peeking my head up, looking to see what's coming. And I can see this gray being floating, just literally floating across the ditch, across the lawn towards the room. And at that point, I lose consciousness. I, I don't know what happens at that point. I, I wake up the next morning, and I see my friend's face covered with grass. And he's just like blah, 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 spitting it out. He says, James, what did you do? That was my friend's name, James. What did you do? What did you do to me? You know? And uh, so that's one experience that I remember having that I, from this awakening experience, what I call this awakening experience, that was something I never knew had happened before. Okay. And I never knew about that. I never knew what was coming into the room and when I was five. So these two experiences, both of them was like, Totally out of the blue. I have no idea that they'd ever happened. Yeah, so that was kind of interesting. And like I said, up to this point in my life, I've never had any regression on them because I would 
rather remember them as they happen to as I remember them so that I don't get any feedback on well yeah you know the regression is only sure. as good as your, your, the hypnosis who gives it type of thing so, so go to your next go to your next event this next one happened when I was 14. Oh, hold on before you go yeah. to 14 how old were you when uh, the last event occurred 11 or 12. okay all right yeah. 14 now you're 14. That. I'm 14, and this is something that I remember. It was. I'm going to tell you how I remembered it, and I'll tell you how it actually happened. I came home from school one day. And we had got there at school. We had got this little trip planned up where we're going to go up to Wyoming because the beer was stronger up in Wyoming. We're going to get a keg of beer. We're going to go up the canyon for the Easter weekend. It was over the Easter weekend, and we're going to have a little party up there. But there's like about 10 of us who got together. So, yeah, OK, let's do this. Man. Says, Meet us at such and such a place and we'll all ride up the canyon together. And uh, say, cool. You know, so I get home from school. I inform my mom that I am going up the canyon to go camping for the weekend. And she looks at me. She says, no, you're not. I says, what do you mean I'm not? She says, no, you're not going up the canyon. You're not going up there. I know who you're going with. You're not going up the canyon. You're going to stick around for Easter weekend and we're going to have a family dinner together and this is the way it's going to go. And then she made the mistake of saying, oh, by the way, I'm going to go pick your brother up at school. Be here when I get back. I'm like, yeah, OK, yeah, uh huh. Yeah, so. She takes off. I immediately load a duffel bag with my sleeping bag, a change of clothes and. A little bit of food and we take off. I take off. And I'm going to hitchhike up the canyon. Now the canyon road is maybe a mile and a half from my house because we live right at the base of the canyon. And uh, I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to go up there, hitchhike, and I'll meet everybody up there because I knew I'd already miss the ride. Yeah. So I make it through the fields. I'm hitchhiking, and this guy shows up. Now this is really bizarre because. I have seen him. I saw him that summer maybe about a half a dozen times up and down the canyon. That's the only place I'd ever meet him is going up and down the canyon. He drove a brown pickup truck. He was a taller guy. He had this weird, crazy hair. He had a brown Chevy pickup truck, I should say. He had this weird, crazy hair. And there's always some small guy sitting next to him. They would never let me sit in the cabin, even though they had room. They always made me jump in the back of the truck. And I stuck my thumb out. No, so longer did I stuck my thumb out. This is going up a canyon that nobody. There's nobody up in the canyon this time of year. You know, it's just there's still a little bit of snow on the ground. There's snow drifts up there that maybe about six or seven inches deep still. You know, it's April. It's still cold at night. I mean, it's getting warmer in the days. You know, it's to where you don't need a jacket on during the days, but at night you definitely need something. So he shows up. I jump in the back of the truck. He takes me right up to the road where. The party is being is going on, but he won't drive up the road. He just stops right there and says, OK, here you go. And I jump out and I'm walking up the road and everybody looks at me and says, how'd you get up here? I said, well, this guy shows up and he gave me a ride. <clears throat> and. Um, we go up the can and he took us up the canyon here and he would always go like a bat out of hell. He was like. <laughs> He would take those turns doing 40 or 50 miles an hour, as I remember. But the funny thing about this point is I don't remember getting from point A to point B. I just remember getting in the truck and then I just remember getting out of the truck. I don't know what happened in between that. You know, at this particular ride, I don't have any recall of how I got there. I just remember getting out of his truck. You know, so which leads me to believe that there may be some screen memory stuff there. I walk up the road and say hello to everybody and uh, they've already been drinking. So I went over and I grab a little bit to drink and the first drink I take, I take one drink. I'm sick to my stomach. I can't drink anymore and I'm over next to the stream. You know. Relieving myself of all my stomach fluid. It was just like it was it was bad. And I sat there for about an hour stick to my stomach and walk back up again i tried to get another drink and it did the same thing happen i'm back over the creek i'm i'm throwing up all over the place 
you know, I don't think I got anything left of my stomach, but I'm actually so up. I said, man, I just can't do this. So my whole night was just spent watching everybody else party. I couldn't do it. It, it was just not working. So my thinking is that they gave me something so that I would not be inebriated later on that day. But anyway, I get up the canyon and um, the police, but long story short, the police end up showing up. They haul everybody off. I take off running and I'm sitting clear up the side of the mountain and watching everybody take off and go. I come back down. There's nobody there. I can't start a fire. It's like nine o'clock at night. It's dark already and it's getting really cold. You know, I mean, it's starting to get really cold. Oh, you have to down jacket on, a sleeveless down jacket on. Yeah, you know, so I figured, well, I got to get out of here. So it's 15 miles to get down to the canyon where you get a house. But there's a house down the golf course, 15 miles down the canyon. And I've got to walk down there in the middle of the night to get to it. So I start walking. And... Um, I hear this sound off into the brushes on the side of me. And it, it just sounds like somebody's walking through the leaves, like three or four, maybe five or six people walking through the leaves. And it's starting to spook me because I'm 14. I'm all alone up in the canyon. There's nobody around. It's just me. You know, there's nobody for 15 miles. It's just me up there by myself. And... Um, I hear that rustling in the brushes and I take off running because I'm thinking, man, this is, what if this is coyotes or something? I'm thinking to myself, coyotes are chasing me down the canyon. So I take off running about 300 yards down this road. And I'm thinking to myself, well, it can't be coyotes because they'd be yiping and jabbing and they would just be chasing me. They'd catch me, right? Coyotes are a lot quicker than I am. They're going to catch me. So I'm sitting there thinking about what it was that I heard that was up there you know, chasing me. And I get this feeling that they're coming back again. I can hear them off in the brushes again. They're coming towards me off of the side of the road. You hear the leaves rustling where they're stepping on the leaves. And I take off running again. And I get lit out of the three or 400 yards down the road. I'm thinking, okay, where can I go? Where can I hide? What am I going to do? You know, and I think I'm just going to have to run out of here. So I keep on running. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, I get this image flashed into my head that there's a herd of skunks down the road that are going to catch me. They're going to be sitting in the road waiting for me, and they're going to spray me. Yeah, I think, okay, this is not going to work because that same summer, my dog got hit by a skunk, and the skunk squirted him really good, and I remember that smell very distinctly. And so I could see all these skunks down the road with their legs lifted up, and they're squirting me if I kept on going. I believe this was a screen memory, a screen memory where they're saying, hey, don't go down here. We don't want you running. We want you stop someplace, you know. So at this point, I'm thinking, well, I got to climb up into a tree. And I'm thinking, well, I'll climb up into a tree. I'll be there all night. Is it, you know, like, God, that's really going to be cold. It's going to be awkward. I'm going to be sitting there. I'm shivering. I'm not going to be able to get any sleep. And I'm kind of panicking. And I'm thinking to myself, well, down the road right here, there's an outhouse. It's one of those national forest outhouses that's made sturdy to prevent animals from getting in. And I think it's open. I'm going to have to run in there to hide. Right? So I run in there and I lock the door and I could hear these footsteps all outside the door. They're walking around outside the door. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, you just sit there, man. You, you're not going to get me in here. And I got my head down near the vent down to the bottom of the floor trying to get some fresh air because you know, it's still an outhouse, right? It's just the only safe place I can find. As a 14-year-old boy, I'm thinking, well, where am I going to go? Where? This is safe. I've got to lock myself in, and I'll wait it out. So I'm sitting in there, and I'm shivering, and I take all the toilet paper, and I wrap it around my legs to you know, because that may give me some warmth because paper acts as an insulator. And I figured, well, I got this insulator around my legs. I'll wrap my legs up and see if that'll help keep me warm a little bit and stuff my arms with my jacket. And I woke. Somehow I fall asleep. Now I'm sitting over there shivering in the corner. 
right? It's cold as all get out. It's probably about 35 degrees out there right now. And inside this outhouse acts like a fridge and it's even colder inside the outhouse than it is outside. And I'm shivering, trying to keep warm. I can't close my eyes. All of a sudden I'm waking up and it's like 10 o'clock or so the next morning. The sun is high in the sky. It's warm outside. And I'm like, well, what the hell happened here? You know, so this was, and I just walked out the door and walked down the road. It, you know, I was totally baffled on how I could have got through the night and not remembered anything. Sure. So I, next day I tell my friends, I say, hey, you know, this happened. They laughed at me and says, oh, what have you been drinking, man? I said, I didn't drink anything. And I was straight as a bee, man. I, nothing, man. And when I had the awakening experience, I, I instantly remembered what had actually happened, that I was being followed down the road by a number of gray beings. And they were off of the bushes trying to kind of approach me, and I was freaking out over that. And I locked myself in the outhouse, and at that point I locked myself in the outhouse, uh, it was like a trance or something. I don't know what it was, but I just went out. You know, I mean, it, I just like passed out. And the door opens up. Now, remember, the door has to open up from the inside. You slide the latch to open it. The latch slides open. It opens up and in walks this gray. And he, the minute he walks in, I open my eyes. I look up at him and say, oh, OK, you know, because it was like I remembered him. Like I knew him. And then we're, <clears throat> we walk outside and there's a ship up above the trees. It's maybe like about 30 high, 30 feet up in the sky up above the tree canopy. And uh, the beam comes down, we go on the ship. And when we're on the ship, I, he guides me and directs me to this chair. Now this chair is kind of like, uh, you know those chairs they used to have back in the day that were like an egg-shaped chair? And they had the stereo headphones in, in front of, in the top of them, and you just kind of swing in it, and it'd be a swing or whatever you want to do. It was an egg-shaped chair. Sure. But it had armrests on it that flipped down. And he directed me to this chair, and I would sit in this chair, and this chair had the armrest where your fingers just slid into the chair and they had separate spots for each one of my fingers and you slide them into the armrest of the chair and it kind of locks in on the chair and then you could move the armrest up and down or around that's how you steer the ship you know if you have manual control and by sitting in this arm in this chair you also are like like act like a chip that's hooked into the ship because now the ship recognizes you and they understand who's there and can can read your thoughts in your minds versus your actions, which if it can read your thoughts in your mind, then it knows where you're trying to go versus where your actions may be telling you you want to go. Okay, because you have a lag between your thoughts and your body movements. And that's why martial artists go train all the time so the body automatically adjusts to what they want to do. Sure. And it was kind of the same thing. The ship was interacting with you. You were like, like the motherboard of the ship at the time, whoever sits in this chair. And it was kind of a training exercise. So I'm looking in front of me, and there's a low bench. It's like maybe about a foot and a half tall that's going around this ship. And by the way, this ship looked like it had been molded. It didn't look like it had been put together by anybody. It just looked like one big piece, you know, rounded corners and everything. And, uh, there's this little control panel that was going in front of, the, front of me. And it just looked like the radio ship besides that. And there were two gray beings that were sitting in this control panel. They were doing their thing. They didn't have any chairs. They were just standing up. And these little buttons were going across the front of the ship. They were colored. Uh, I'm not sure. They were like orange and red. And they had these different colors on them. And so what they would do is they were just doing something, controls or something with the ship, interacting with the ship somehow. 
And so they were doing around pressing the colored buttons and, you know, they got to one point where they pressed some buttons and the whole of the ship gave way. The whole, to everything above the board, this board that they had in front of them, or the console, I should say, in front of them, gave way and then you had a clear view of what's going on outside the ship. And it was looking like, uh, if you've seen an OLED TV, the clarity was that clear. I mean, I can look at that, and we didn't have high def at the time. We didn't even know what it was, you know, but the clarity looking through that screen <clears throat> was just OLED quality. It was so clear, so clear. I could look down there and I could see the tops of the trees and leaves on the trees. I looked down and I could see these gray beings just wandering around the forest. I don't know what they were doing. You know, they were kind of wandering around the forest doing their thing. And then uh, we took off. And I was basically flying the ship. I would say I was flying, but I think the ship itself kind of knew what it was doing. And so it was kind of interacting. It was kind of like a training exercise, I guess. So we flew, we took off and but it wasn't like we were actually flying until we got away from the Earth. And then it was just like, I mean, we were flying up outside the Earth boundary. Then all of a sudden it was just like, boom. And we were sitting in the middle of the universe somewhere. I don't, I, I guess it was. I don't know where it was at. It was like, you know, but it was, everything was so bright and everything was so lit up. And there are so many stars and there's so many planets around us that, you know, I mean, you could see them out there, but they weren't close enough to really affect you. And you could see the stars out there and it was just really bright and lit up. And in front of us was this huge, huge ship of some sort. And it was donut shaped. And it's really hard to get a grasp of how big it really was because you're out in space and you're looking at something and you have no real concept of how big something is. I mean, you can look at the Grand Canyon and have no concept of how big the Grand Canyon is until you set a human being up next to it so you can get an idea of the scale. But when you're in space, you have no idea of what the scale is because there's, there's no reference point for you to say, oh, I know how big this is. The, sure. only, way I, the only way I could see how big it was, was there's like five, five or six stories of windows there, you know, that I could see on the side of the ship. This do, even though it was a donut shape, it still had some pretty big windows on the outside. So my guess is maybe it was five or six stories tall and maybe a half a mile across, I guess. It was a really huge. It's a really, really big. And you'd come to it and have this little docking area and you just dock the ship. And when we dock the ship, there's uh, another being sitting there waiting for me. And this was very much like a white, a tall white or a Nordic of some sort. He was very human looking. And I would come across him later on in life quite a bit. You know, so I, I know his name and I know his name is actually called Raphael. He calls himself Raphael, but he, he says, don't confuse me with the angel because I'm not the angel. Just call me Raphael. Okay. And he's very stern and he's very to the point and he doesn't really mess around, but he was guiding me around this ship. We're on the ship. We're walking around it. We get to this room and uh, at this room, we look in and there's a whole bunch of kids of different races sitting in front of this like this blackboard. It looks like it's maybe a teaching environment of some sort. And there's this really old looking guy who's. Uh, well, you get the sense that he's really old and he's kind of. Like a small doggish looking guy. You know, he's kind of got a little bit of dog features to him and droopy chin, droopy saggy uh, cheeks and uh, but he's I get the impression he's very intelligent and you look up at the board and he would point and there would be these equations or you know different types of symbols and something that would pop up on the board 
And then he would look back at the students like, do you recognize? And they'd shake their heads. Yeah, 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 I'll recognize. And uh, then that would erase and you'd have some more equations and stuff would pop up on the board. And he looked back at me and smiled like, okay, it's nice to see you here. And we would walk around the ship. And uh, that's one of the main things that I remember about that ship. And like I say, then I just kind of wake up in the bathroom. How I got from there to the back of the bathroom, I just outdoor privy, I don't know. So you, and it, the how, sun old, how, you, how, how old were you when you were on this huge ship? 14. 14. And yep. you got this through hypnotic regression? No. This is, this is just remembered stuff I remember. And what, it, you were 24 when you remembered? Yep. Okay, go go past the 14-year-old uh, on the ship experience. Or, or if it continues, tell more about what happened. No, that's, um, the one thing that really gets me about the ship that I was on though, is later on, I had I did I've never told anybody about that for quite a while because of course at 24 I didn't know about it but I found out Bob Lazar to take Bob for what you want to take him for good or bad or whatever but he described the inside of this ship perfectly just exactly as I saw it he described the screen being there he described everything except there are chairs for the ET guys for the gray guys and there were no it's chairs much the big no. ship. The ship that I was, uh, no, not the big ship. It was a small ship. It was like the scout craft is what he called it. Okay. So he, he described that perfectly and it just blew my mind. It was on, I believe I ran across on YouTube once upon a time. So, you know, <clears throat> like I said, I think if you will, Bob was out there for both good and bad, but I believe he saw something because he wouldn't have been able to describe it just like I was on it. So okay. it was there. And um, let's see what we got going on next. Besides just having the haunted house experience of uh, my youth. Yeah, that's pretty much. <coughs> so later on, everything kind of dies down for a while. Later on, um, I get married. I have my son. We, I ended up with custody of him at a very, very young age, he was nine months old, and immediately there was stuff that started as well. He told me things that I never knew, that uh, as a baby even, you know, he was like two years old, he'd find himself out in the backyard, and these beings would be surrounding him with robes and uh, doing something, I don't know, you know, uh, and we would kind of share these experiences back and forth with each other for a while, but you know, it would I'd be every time I'd be sitting in that house. This is uh in my you know, about probably about twenty years old, twenty one years old, because that's the time I ended up with him. And you would hear being in the basement <coughs> oh, excuse me, sorry. Being in the basement, there's about there's some stairs that ran down right next to me and there's a little hallway. And then his room was just off to the side. And so I would sit, be sitting there working on the computer. And there's a door at the top of the stairs. The door opened, the door shut. You'd hear somebody run down the stairs. You'd hear him run around and uh, hear his door slam and shut. And there'd never be anybody there. I'd say, I'd think, of, well, hello, hello. I'd go over to open the door. There'd be nobody in his room. How old so is he at this time? He at this time was probably about 15. And it was okay. common to start hearing these knocking on the windows, which is just at uh, this continued on for a while. I don't know where, but it's kind of like the sign of the trilogy where you hear the three knocks. And between him and me both, we start hearing these knocks on the windows. You know, it's just knock, knock, knock. There'd be three knocks here and then nothing would happen. Or the doorbell would ring three times or, you know, it got so bad I went camping one time and I was out in the middle of the woods by myself and I'd hear somebody knocking on the tent flap of my tent, but it sounded like somebody was knocking on wood. 
Yeah, and I'm and I'm out there in the middle of nowhere, and you're hearing these sounds going on of these weird lights flip on and on, off every once in a while here and there. And uh, one time I'm sitting down in my room reading a book, and you hear everything in the shelf just kind of poof flies off the shelf in a room upstairs. You go upstairs, and there'd be the Tupperware scattered across the room for no apparent reason. So there's definitely some stuff that went on in that regard. Uh, it never got any more serious than that, but I often wonder about that because it's a brand new house we're living in. You know? Sounds like something's been following you around your whole life besides aliens. Yeah, and that would sort of go to par because there's a whole shamanic thing that went on that uh, opened up some doors and it it got really weird. Um, the next event I had though was, and I'm writing an article on this right now, so I'm going to be posting it on my blog page before long, but it's where um, I'm lying in bed and I I could, I could see these figures all standing around me. I have no idea what they're there for, and then they go. And the next day, I'm lying in bed, wondering whether I'm going to get up or go back to sleep. You know how you get that state? You get that trance state, and you're kind of you can you're aware of what's going on, and you're just waking up from sleep, and you're thinking, man, maybe I should just go back to sleep. You hit the snooze button or whatever, and you maybe I should just go back to sleep, and you kind of in that weird state of mind where you're not getting up and you're not going back to sleep, you're just kind of tranced out. So I'm sitting there like that. I live, we lived in a, like I said, a small community. We had a lot of animals. The window above my bed was open. It always was open. There's never a screen in it. It was the middle of the summer. How old are you? Then yeah, probably about 20, 21. I'm thinking probably 21. Yeah, okay, go ahead. go ahead. And, um, <clears throat> I'm sitting there wondering whether I'm going to get up or go back to sleep. Now, I can hear the wind start, I mean, the breeze start blowing the curtains above my bed. I know that it's getting, it's going to be getting light pretty soon because that's when the sun comes up, the breeze starts blowing a little bit, and the shape, the curtains start flop, flopping back and forth. And so I know that the sun's going to be shining down pretty soon. I'm thinking, oh, it must be about six or seven. I'm going to, should I get up or should I go back to sleep? Huh? Thinking, oh, maybe I'll just go back to sleep. And I hear this little purring off to the side of my bed. And uh, I'm thinking the damn cat, because we had cats, animals. We had all kinds of animals when I was growing up. And so it was not uncommon for every once in a while you wake in and see a cat, the cat in the room, or, you know, the dog had got scared and jumped through the window or something of that nature. You know, it was like, but I'm laying there thinking, oh, God, the cat got in the room. How'd the cat get in the room? And then it dawns on me that, uh, well, whose cat is this? Because we don't have a cat right now. There's, you know, we don't have a cat. So whose cat is this? And I hear it go meow. And uh, I have my hand underneath my pillow. And I just look at, I open my eyes. I look at, and the minute I open my eyes, I'm looking out there. And I just see two arms floating in space. You know, there, there are two gray arms. You see three fingers and this thumb on one arm. And it's just like it's cut off at the elbows. You just see the arms. And on this left hand, the three fingers and thumb is open like that. And it's holding this little blue, maybe it's about this long. It's a little neon blue light, looks like a light stick. And I'm watching it as it comes towards me. And uh, I can't move at this point. I'm frozen in place. I, the only thing I can really move is my eyes. And I can move my eyes around the room. And there's nothing else there. It's just me and these arms floating in space. And this one arm has this blue neon light. And it's just like a little rod. But on the end of it, it's oval shaped like an egg. And I, I can see that as it's coming towards me. And it comes right up to my forehead, and he holds it to my forehead, and he slaps it with his other hand. And my head jerks back in my pillow. It physically it jerks back in my pillow. I go, what the hell? And he hits this thing like about nine times. I, 
I don't know why it's so specific and why I remember the nine, but he hits it nine times and it gets halfway into my head. And then it just kind of sucks in. He moves his hand, it just kind of sucks in. You hear it go, sucks into my head and right above my third eye, right here. And the minute that sucks into my head, the hands just disappear and my body is free and I spring up out of bed and I'm like, what? the hell is that you know it just kind of i cut i mean what are you going to do i mean it's this thing is pounding into my head and i can feel it tingling sensation and my hair is kind of standing on end a little bit and the minute i said that it's like somebody there was answering me and i said this is a monitoring device that will allow you to be able to see clearly and monitor situations. That kind of thing came through. And they said, we will be back tomorrow. We will show you how to activate it. And at the time, I was too stunned to say, we'll just get the thing out. You know, it's like something about it really resonated with me. But the other thing was, yeah, what is this thing that they just put in my head? So that day I'm kind of I'm walking around I, I just kind of forget about it even though my head is tingling a little bit because of life well what are you gonna do really I mean what do you what are you realistically what are you gonna do so I get to bed I'm feeling half decent I fall asleep and sometime about maybe about two or three in the morning I hear this voice again it says sit up please it's very polite I don't know why it says sit up please so I sit up the minute I sit up, the voice says, straighten your back. And I'm sitting in my bed. It says, crop my, I cross my legs. And it says, straighten your back. So I straighten my back. He says, now, imagine the energy. Watch the energy flow up your spine from the ground, up through your spine, and shoot it out through your forehead. I said, I just kind of followed the instructions at that point. And I did that and I could feel this warm, tingly sensation flow up my spine. It came out through my forehead and went boom. And my head just kind of exploded. It just went crazy. And uh, I didn't sleep very well the rest of the night. It says, now this is how, now the device has been activated and the voice just disappeared. Yeah, it's like, one of these little weird things that happens you i have no idea what that is i didn't ask for it i don't recall asking for it and then they put it in my head anyway so over the next two weeks i developed this really red rash over the front of my third eye right here it was just this rash and the skin started to peel and it lasted for about a week week and a half everybody looked at me and says well how did you what happened to your forehead i said what am I going to say? Hey, these hands showed up and they, you know, shoved a light in my forehead. And it's just like, oh, I don't know. I must have got a rash or something. You know? And the top of my head started just tingling. And for the next week and a half, it was really hard to sleep because if you say like you use a certain shampoo and you feel it tingling in your hair, you multiply that by 10 and it was just like, it was so bad that I had a hard time even sleeping at nights because this thing was just tingling in my hair really bad. I felt like my hair was on end. Finally, everything just graduated and went away, but my third eye was blown wide open. It was just like, you know, I was able to do this thing called consciousness, what they called consciousness sharing. That really started in earnest about that time. Was, well, not until maybe about 25, 23 or 24 that it really started to activate some senses in there. And they, so for even now, for a really long time, when I was doing this consciousness sharing thing, I had a hard time trying to figure out what it was. It was like, okay, is it remote viewing? Is it astral projection? Because it didn't really fit anything. It's not lucid dreaming, astral projection remote viewing, it didn't fit any of those parameters, you know, so I'm, it wasn't until recently when I actually wrote back to Robert Monroe Institute, took some classes back there, that I got a better idea of what was, what had happened to me, and why I was able to do all this, and 
they always call they always call it consciousness sharing. The guys I would communicate with call it consciousness sharing. And uh, as far as I know, that's on the upper end of remote viewing with a twist of astral projection thrown into it. So that's kind of what they initiated me for at that particular point. So it's just uh, one of those, what the hell? Yeah. So do you still, is that still part of your life? Yeah, very much so. It's like, um, it allows me to be able to see beyond the human form. So say like if I'm doing energy work for somebody, uh, I look a couple levels past their body into their spirit body or their astral body, whatever it may be, to find and locate energies that may be attached to them. Because a lot of times, if you get possessed, and I have had a kind of a possession type of thing happen to me, um, many times it may not even affect us physical body it affects the spiritual body and it works through the spiritual body into the physical body so people will go through and say well i've cleared that out it's gone so maybe they have or maybe they have and i had a lady come to me once upon a time and she said hey you know what the catholic church has done some work on me and it felt good at first but whatever it is is back and i said well yeah you got this little grimmel thing falling around and it's calling up on your shoulders and yada 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 and so i was able to be able to you know, get her cleansed out and rid of that, and she's she's doing fairly well now. So, yeah. so what's the next thing that happened to you after they opened up? Oh, <clears throat> a lot of things. I think the main thing so, would be that. Well, hold on before you go to the next thing. So, um, yeah, you did. Who was it that opened your third eye? Do you know? I just know it's some sort of a gray thing. I don't know. To be honest with you, to this day, I don't know who it was that did that. I would think that it may be my mentor being who may have stepped in to do that because he was pretty well associated with me at the time. But I, I really don't know. I mean, these kind of odd little things just happen, and they just out of the blue, and they're like, boom. Yeah, so. Okay, so go to your next event. The next one would be that awakening experience that we talked about. 24. Uh, and when I was 24, yeah. At the time, I'd really been getting it. I've, I've been born again Christian, okay? I was 100% wool-blown, blue-eyed, tied, dyed, whatever you want to call it, uh, 100% following my faith, and I was going to follow it to the end, and I was going to be the next thing since sliced bread or something like that, you know, because I was heavily involved with the organization. I was teaching everybody, and I was, you know, like a Sunday school teacher and a Sunday school president, and then teaching a men's quorum, and uh, really gung-ho, you know. I was like, you know, boy scouting it, the whole shot. It was like, you know, I was, I was sold on it, right? And um, but I was also getting interested in some of this weird little paranormal stuff that was happening. Like not, nothing. It was more like to do with ghosts, and it had more to do with uh, the Bermuda Triangle, that kind of thing. In fact, it, Leonard and Moy came out with this "In Search of" series back in the day, and I no, was hooked no, on that. Remember. Yeah, I was hooked on that "In Search of" series. So I remember going to the library and looking for some books uh, in our area you didn't find a lot of information about that but they did have some stuff in the library about things of that nature and um i came across an et thing once i think no that's silly the devil i don't want to mess with the devil and i put it up it says you know devil has his ways you know we're we're the only thing christ is the savior you know whatever you may think about it is fine i don't care but you know and this is the only world that matters, yada, yada, yada. <clears throat> and uh, there's nothing else out there. Yeah. And I watched this in search of series. I'm thinking, oh, did, where did these ships go? What happened to this Bermuda Triangle stuff? And I fell asleep and I wake up like about, must have been about two or three in the morning. And 
The situation was uh, when I, I was living with my mom with my as a single parent, trying to get back on my feet. I had a my son was four years old. He had a mattress laid down on the floor next to me, and up above us was a uh, right next to us was a bookcase. It had a lot of encyclopedias and stuff like that, and it also had a little toy Jeep that I got him for his birthday one year. <clears throat> Battery operated. He wasn't playing with it. He just set it up on the shelf. It got covered with dust. And that was it. You know, it just sitting there. Well, I this uh, kind of sets a story for what happened next. <clears throat> well, I'm um, as asleep, and all of a sudden. I hear something in my room and I get up and I look over at my son sitting at the side of his mattress and he's pushing this little Jeep back and forth. He's playing with it. And I'm kind of annoyed because it's like 2.30 or 3 in the morning, I say. And then I notice there's something else in the room. I look over in the corner, floating in the corner is this, my mentor, the gray being. And he's sitting there staring at my son and he points a finger at him like, yeah, pointing at him, saying, like, we'd like him to come. <clears throat> and I called him, I looked at him and said, oh, well, if he's going, I'm going too, so he knows that he's going to be safe, because I'm familiar with this guy, and I'm familiar with the exploits of some of the things that they do. And I'm saying, I'm going to go with him, because if I do that, he knows I'm going to be with him, he knows he's going to be safe. <clears throat> so he takes us. And there's a beam that's coming down in the room. Now, it's really weird how this is coming. It's, there's a set of cement stairs right outside the wall upstairs because we're in the basement again, right? And so there's a ground and there's the cement floor, the cement steps, which is, they're huge cement steps. They're maybe about three feet tall, all right, and three feet wide. They're just a huge cement block. We go through this light, through the ground, through the cement steps, up into the outside of the house up above the ground. <clears throat> As we're floating, I'm looking around and I'm noticing that uh, there's no sound. I don't hear any crickets. This is the, the middle of the summer, in the middle of the night. Crickets are usually out there in the abundance, right? You hear them all over the place. There are no crickets. There's no wind blowing, there are no dogs barking, nothing is going on. It's just me and my son in this gravy flying into this light and across the street through on the other side of the telephone lines, the electrical lines, there's this ship floating there. And it's got this red and these blue lights floating around the ship. I mean, they're, how do you call it, strobing around the ship, right? And there's this house sitting next to it, right? next to it, maybe about 10 feet below it. And I could see the lights shining off the top of the house, strobing off the top of the house. And there's nobody in the neighborhood moving. Nobody's doing anything. It's just like we're stepping into a vacuum, which I believe in a fact is probably what's happened is because they, it may be an interdimensional thing that they're taking us through to get to the ship because nobody's, I think if somebody would have been out there, they might not even notice us, but we're still going to the ship. Right. I was following behind the gray, and then I was holding my son's hand, and I could see these electrical lines coming towards us. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, we're going through those lines, man. We're going through those lines. We're going to get fried, you know. I'm kind of cringing, and we go through the lines, and the only thing that happens is you can hear, feel this tingling sensation as we're going through. You know, as electricity and line is kind of tingling in our bodies a little bit, but yeah. we're going through these lines. And we get on the ship, <clears throat> and it takes us off somewhere. It's, I, I believe we're probably taken to a bigger ship someplace. And we're on this ship, and I'm by myself with this lady. Excuse me. And um, how you feel? Go with the lady, or the now? No, the, the yawning. Oh, yeah, yes. I've been doing it a lot. Yeah. I'm running out of breath here in a little bit, and it's like um, 
higher vibrational thing it hits and it does that to you sometimes too so um and we're walking around the edge of the ship and it's kind of cornering around and we're stepping on some sort of uh like rubberized foam type of stuff that's a little bit sticky but it's not sticking to your feet it's just kind of holding you in place and we're walking around the ship and she's off to the right of me i mean the left of me we're walking around the corner of the ship and she just she's this lady she's she's taller than i am maybe about six feet tall i'm five six and um, she's got these brilliant blue eyes, blonde hair. She's wearing a kind of a jump shoot that more looks like a camouflage outfit than it is anything else. Yeah, and she's definitely like a Nordic lady. And she, she's leading me down the ship. And I've had been having a stomach problem physically up to that point, a little bit of irritable bowel syndrome, and I lot of the irritable bowel syndrome and i looked at her and i said can you please heal me of this i'm having some real problems with my stomach and can you please just heal me help me get over this and she looked at me and she laughed she had this smile and this really loving look in her eyes and she laughed at me but it's communication through that through the mind she's not saying anything she's just it's just mind to mind communication Right. And she laughs at me, and I'm like really put off by it. I says, no, I'm serious. And she puts her hand on my shoulder at that point, and she says, don't worry, you're going to be okay. And I get the reason she's laughing at me is because she's laughing because there's a healer coming to her asking for her to heal him. <laughs> and she thinks that's the irony and the humor of the whole thing. And, and I said, oh, of course, because... You know, it was like just me being really an idiot asking her in the first place. So we continue walking around the ship. And we get to a doorway off the left hand side. And it's arched. There's an arched doorway. And you're looking into the room and there's my son and a little friend that he had found or they had hooked him up with or something that were standing around this vertical pole that was going up the length of the ship. And around the ship, there's a catwalk. Yeah, and uh, it's just in a circular being around this metal pole. And on this pole was looked like a shower massage of some sort. Right? It was just a thing of a shower massage stuck onto the pole on a cord. And he would pick it up and he'd hold it over his head. And you could see these little blue bolts of electricity just flow over his body. And it would sink down into the floor, and he would laugh. He thought that it must have tickled him or something because he thought it was funny. He would laugh. And then his old friend would yank it from him and hold it over his head, and it would flow over his body, and he would laugh as well. And they they were fighting over this massage unit to, you know, keep sending these bolts of electricity over him. And she looked at me like, "Hey, you see, he's safe. He's okay. You know, don't worry about it. He he's he's a good hands." We hooked him up with somebody to keep him company, I guess. Yeah. And uh, we continue walking around the ship and he shows me, she shows me this lady. She's a little bit younger than me and her face is blotted out. She's got curly black hair. It goes over her shoulders. Um, and she says, this lady's going to change your life. And I just looked at her and nodded my head and said, hmm, okay, whatever, you know. And um, the next thing that I knew, I was outside the ship. And we were standing in, I know whose house it was. It was a neighbor's house down the street who just moved in. And the gray, my mentor, is standing right next to the left side of me. And that would be, and we're in the garage. You can see the boxes stacked up on the side. They hadn't unpacked everything yet. They were all sitting in boxes. And you look down to the door side of the garage, and you could see this shadow figure walking back and forth across the across the floor of the garage. It hit one side, 
and they'd turn around and he'd walk back to the other side. They hit that side and they'd turn around back. And he kept doing this and we kept observing him. And finally he pointed his finger at him, his, his left hand at him, and he says, it is forbidden to walk through those. It would just blast like a foghorn into my head. He says, it is forbidden to walk through those. And what I take from this later on in life is that, you know, this is a negative entity. Don't share your energy with this negative energy. It's like, do not do the possession thing. You know, this is how people get possessed. And that was his way of telling me of possession. The next thing I know again, and that ended right then and there. And oh, by the way, later on in life, you know, the next year I find out that the guy that moved in the house was molesting his daughters. And he spent some time in prison over that. He went to prison over that. And they immediately moved there. Whoever was in the house just immediately moved after that. So I'm thinking he was possessed. And that was the spirit that was possessing him. So, and that's very real how that works. But anyway, I'm back in the house. And I'm sitting in the house and I'm looking through the screen door. We have a great big old. There's a great big old plate glass window in the living room, and it sits up on the top floor. And this plate glass window is like about eight foot by eight foot. It's just a huge plate glass window. Yeah. And then the door is right next to it. The door is open. You're looking through the screen door. And I can see the ship across the street hovering in the air right where it picked us up. And the lights around it, you can feel the strobing lights around it are flashing off the people in the room. And it was just like a really eerie kind of a sensation the ship was letting out this low hum it was like a like you'd hear on tv or something you know like that little boom and i hear this tussle going on right next to me and i look next to me in the love seat sitting next to me is my son with his little friend that he had on the ship i come to find out that this little friend was actually the guy who just moved into town who had turned into one of his best buddies later on. You know, so they, they, there's a definite connection there. And um, they were tussling on the left, this living room sofa right there, this love seat that was sitting right next to me. And I'm staring across, I look across the room and the thing that sticks out to me so much this day is there's an older couple sitting across the room. Everybody in the room is naked. They don't have a stitch of clothing on. I have no idea why, but they, they're all naked. And there's this older guy who's sitting next to across from his wife. And I know who they are, too. They were like the sheriff of the town at the time, you know, the police force of the town. Well-known, well-respected people. And they were sitting across the room next to a fireplace that was over there. And they're staring at each other, but they're comatose. Everybody in the room is just comatose, but us three. I have no idea why we were the ones who were not, but everybody was just kind of standing there in a trance-like state, there are probably about 10 other people just standing around in a trance-like state, and these two were staring at each other. I don't know idea why they put them next to each other. But that was definitely these people who were these well-respected people in the community. And I remember this day, the light strobing off their faces, you know, it's just as plain as day. They were just like a Rod Serling movie or something. Yeah. And the next thing I remember is everybody's cleared out and I spring up out of my bed. I'm like plop, plopped into my bed. My son's over there plopped on top of the sheets asleep, on top of the cover asleep. And I plop back in. I wake up immediately and I'm like, it, it's just before the sun was coming up. So whatever taking us had taken us for a couple hours. And uh, at least in our time, I don't know how long it was in their time, but in our time it was a couple hours. And the minute my eyes popped open and I stood up, I had this past life memory event of all these events that I just talked about up to that point. And the one event, you know, when I'm chasing down the canyon in the canyon, I remembered some of that, but it always seemed weird, like nothing had happened. And, uh, you know, these events that I would just go wandering off into the, scrub brush for no reason whatsoever and hitchhike a ride down the road and these two guys would be there to pick me up and take me here or there or wherever I need to go. You know, <clears throat> uh, they were tied into it somehow. 
And all these past life events just popped open all the way back to where before I was born. And it was just instantaneous memories. It was just like I remembered it just as clear day and it blew me away. I mean, it's like I, I write in my art of one of my articles about ontological shock that John Professor John Mack coined when he was before he died in regards to alien contact. It was that same thing. I was just it, immediately it was just like. I have no idea where to put this. I don't know what to do with it. I have, you know, I spent three or four days trying to get a hold of uh, the internet had just come out, so I was trying to get a hold of somebody back east is Kufos Center for UFO Studies back in Illinois that uh, Dr. Heineck had set up. He'd been on the uh, blue, what do you call it, the team? Project Blue Book. I yeah. think he was involved with Project Blue Book. Um, so I called back to Kufos, which had just been set up a little while, you know, maybe about nine years earlier, if even that. And uh, as some assistant answered the phone, and I just let out with a splur of, you know, hey, man, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening, you know, and, uh, you know, I need somebody to talk to because in a religious community such as I was living in, you're not going to find anybody to talk to. It's not going to happen, you know. Uh, they're going to lock you up. They're going to give you some pills. They're going to do something. But, you know, it's like, no, you've been possessed by the devil type of thing. And it was not the devil. This was real. It had happened. And my whole paradigm of what life was about at that time had totally, like, been blown out of the water. You know? And so I carried that around for about six or seven months, waiting for them to get back with me. And nobody ever got back with me. He said, yeah. You know, sketch this out diagram, write down everything you know, send it to us, and we'll get back with you as soon as possible. And I gave him my phone number, the address, and everything, and uh, never heard anything back from anybody. So, you know, I, I just went around for the next 13 years pretending I was religious and, you know, having all these out of this experience with this craft. And it got down to the point where it's either, you know, you, you you got to make up your mind. Is this going to be a religious thing or is it going to be a paraphysical thing? You know, I mean, yeah. so my whole thing was I eventually said, well, there's too many questions involving religious values on this. I mean, I had to delve deep inside to try to figure out what was going on because this was so far out of the paradigm, which I had just I had just barely converted back into religious atmosphere and was really gung ho on it and now all of a sudden you know wow this is just totally totally blew me away so i just buried it for 13 years and developed some pretty bad ptsd over the thing so it was so this takes you from 24 to 30 uh not 37 it's about 37 when i first decided again i was going to start you know venturing back venturing into finding out what this was all about. At this point, it was like, okay, this event happened to me. And I don't remember anything other than the spiritual stuff of, you know, trying to leave my body physically, because I secretly, I started working and trying to do some astral projection stuff. Because I'm figuring and, and do some shamanic, uh, you know, traveling of some sort, because I figured you had to go inside to find the answers, because there's nobody out there that I'm running across that I know of. This is Utah, right? It's such a conservative community. There's no organizations out there that I was aware of that I could get a hold of. I hadn't even heard of anything like this happening before. You know, it was only after going to the library and reading about it, I understood that it actually happened. In fact, the next day on the event, after the event had happened, I just dropped everything I was doing. I ran straight to the library looking for books to try to find out what had happened. At the age of 24. Uh, at the age of 24, and the first day I got back, I, was, I on the, that next day, like I said, I go back to the library, I study in the library till the library closes. I'm reading everything I can find about the subject, and I say, okay, if this is really true and this really happened, because I was still doubting everything about it, you know, even after all that happened, I says, you know, I'll, you have my son come forward and tell me about this happening, right? And so I get home. And he meets me, which he doesn't usually does. He says, Dad, can I tell you about the dream I had last night? 
I need to start any this is describing little details of stuff. And what how old are you at this time? Twenty four. He was four. OK. Yeah. And uh, they had taken him with me and he says, I got the scratch on the back of my leg. I look back as a half moon scratch. You know, it'd been like it had been scoop, a scoop mark out there. And I just and I'd just been reading about scoop marks and it just kind of blew me away. I'm thinking, he said, yeah, I had a dream that I was being chased and, you know, yada, yada, yada. And he broke down into some details about that. And I'm thinking, man, this has got to be, this has got to be real. You know, there's no way that this is just something my imagination has dreamed up. But trying to figure out how all the pieces put together after that is another story. You know, it's, like I was saying, you have block, box A that's in your mind right here that's like, okay, this is all my stored beliefs that this is what I believe now. And then you have way over the left right hand side, you have box B. And it just, there's so much incompatibility between those two that they, nothing fits, you know? And so my belief system had been totally just blown away at that point. So what was it again that, that opened your mind at 24? The actual event? Oh, it was just like a, something like a, in search of. It was just a curiosity. It was oh, no, I mean, what what caused you to remember all your stuff? At the age of oh, it was like the, um, like when you, when somebody dies and they come back to life, you know, they have a near-death experiences, a lot of times they'll describe their whole life flashes before their eyes. Right. Okay. This was the same thing. I wake up, my whole life of ET existence flashed before my eyes, and I instantaneously, everything clicked. So this was ha it just happened as you're waking up. And I'm waking up right after I right the minute my head came up out of the pillow and I opened my eyes, it like bang, and all this flashed into my head, and I had instantaneous memory of it all. So what's the next thing that happened to you? Oh. The next main event, let's see. There's a lot of shamanic stuff that happened up to that point. So don't um, don't don't go past anything. Don't jump yeah. just because it's shamanic. Yeah, well the shamanic stuff some of I don't talk about because um, of the nature of it. I will probably well, you can say anything about it you want. You don't have to get into details. Yeah, it was, uh, I had this encounter. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get into it a little bit right here. Well, I started off with the shamanic stuff. And I basically, I told whoever was out there, because I didn't know who was out there at the time. I said, look, you know what? I want to go down the rabbit hole on this. I've got to figure out what's going on. And I'm not going to stop until I have an answer. Because that was like my bowl and china shop thing. Okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to find out what happened. And I'm going to know why it happened and then why to me. And I wanted all the answers. I said, you lead me down the rabbit hole so I can find out what's going on because I wanted some answers. Well, I started in meditations and uh, this out of body stuff. It, there was a lot of, um, how should I say it? It was kind of a remote viewing type of thing where it was a consciousness sharing stuff that I would do. Okay, and that's what started off first. I started meditating and I started getting into this thing where I could leave my body from the top of my head. I'd just fly up through the top of my head. I'd go up someplace and I'd hold my position there for a minute just to get my bearings. And then at that point, I can go do whatever I want. And it got really interesting because I didn't think there were any consequences for me going out there doing whatever I wanted just to fly. Or, you, know, you don't have any. <clears throat> what you got to understand is that morals are a human thing. Okay, they're developed by a human society. When you get outside of your body and you're going into the lower world, they don't have human morals. They don't have a construct of why you should be this way or that. They only have a construct of what is it going to be to keep me alive? And how am I going to stay alive type of thing? And so you're very easily a feast then because you're conduit to the outside world and they can you know, do their energy thing. That's why. 
But one of the ones that was really interesting was <clears throat> I did a uh, trip to Mars. And it started out innocent enough. I just thought, huh, there's something over here. Let's go investigate this. Let's investigate this. Let's investigate this. And I saw myself in a room with some individuals. There's a big old flat screen TV on one side. And I'm certain today that this was an actual place that I went out of body because that happened quite a bit. So I went to this place out of body. had the big screen TV on the left side of the room. And it was playing some sort of daytime TV show. There were some magazines on the table, a couple of guys laying in on the couch, and some were, you know, playing a board game or something of that nature. They were younger individuals, maybe in their 20s. And I can remember walking through the room, just kind of observing what was going on. And at the end of the room, there was a big old screen door. It wasn't a screen door, it was a glass patio door. And I look outside and I see a scene out there. I said, huh, I wonder what that is. So I walk through it and I'm on Mars. Yeah. And as I'm viewing the situation around, I notice that there's these those pyramids off to one side. But farther down there, I see something moving. I see some sort of life out there moving. And I immediately project myself over to it. And when I see this life out there, he looks like a, a gray human type of thing. He's got pale gray features to him. And he's wearing this uniform. He didn't have a mask on or anything like that. And he was standing next down off to the right hand side. There was a little lake that looked like it was kind of drying up. And there's some weird shrubs that are growing up a little bit and kind of up next to a hill. And the farther you go up the hill, the less shrubs there were and everything just kind of died out after that. So underneath that, right next on the sitting on the hill up above this lake, there was a Pueblo type at the house. It looked like something you'd see a Hopi Indian living in, right? And there's a Pueblo there. And this guy met me as I was walking up. And he, I said, well, what is this? He says, this is the last remnants. I'm like, of what? He says, well, our planet is dying and we need to get off it. And I'm saying, well, what happened? He said, there was a near planetary collision type of thing that just nearly tore the planet in half, but the gravity kind of pulls it back together. You know, the other planet coming by was much bigger. And so it kind of pulled the planet apart, put it back together. It stuck back together due to its mass and its gravity, which if you look at it, there's that huge canyon that goes through Mars right there, right? The huge big one. That's as I recall him saying, that's kind of a remnant of what, as a result of what happened to them. And the water, either one or two things, went out of ground or was sucked up to this other planet, you know? And as a result, life is going to be gone pretty soon off this planet. And uh, so I hit him up a little farther about it. I said, well, how did this happen? Well, what, what, what are you gonna do? He says, well, thanks, thank goodness for the grays. They've given us the technology to be able to leave and go live elsewhere. And so there's a gray civilization, probably the Zeta Reticuli, is what I'm assuming, that helped them be able to survive and move off Mars because it was populated by humans and there was water on it once upon a time and it was a lively planet. So some people say, oh, you know, it's a nuclear explosion, but. I have the feeling from what he was saying, it was just more of a planetary bypass, which would explain why Uranus and Neptune and Earth are all shifted a little bit because once upon a time, the planets were 90 degrees to the sun and swirled around the sun. But his take on it was this planet had pulled these other planets off course a little bit and shifted their axis. And that's why they spin on a different axis. It's a near planetary event versus anything else that just kind of pulled them off. And he says they happen every great once in a while, but we are leaving. And after that, I'm just kind of but interesting. I came back to contemplate that for a minute. I'm back in my body to contemplate that for a minute. So whether that, that was probably a space of time event to where 
it was a different time in a different space, you know. And if it actually happened or not, it makes sense, but who knows? You know, I mean, you should got somebody's opinion to go off of. It's just like anything nowadays. I mean, you're going to take what I'm saying and uh, you could take everything I'm saying and say, well, that's just your opinion. That's just a story. And I'd be fine because I have no proof to back it up. It's just me, my word. I thought right? you were going to get into your attachment, but you didn't go. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get into that as well, too. But that was just uh, one of the things that started happening. That's how it went, how I started to do it. So after this, I started really getting into the shamanic side of thing. And what I didn't know was I was astral projecting down into these realms, kind of an astral projection down into the realms versus just going down there in consciousness. I was physically, I was spiritually going down into these realms. So I had this place that I had set up in my mind that I would go into, you know, I'd delve deep down into my mind like you do in hypnosis. You take somebody down and there's a process that you take down. I did the same thing as I'd studied hypnosis. Like, well, I'm going to combine hypnosis with what I'm doing and you know, go deep into myself and see if I can find some answers, right? Um, so I developed this place deep down inside myself, at least what I thought was myself. And it was a beach. It was a sandy beach. It was in a lagoon. And there's some mountains off to one side, some cave structures over here. And off the side, there's a cliff with a fall foliage and everything alongside that cliff, right? Well, the bottom line what happened on this was uh, somebody shows up into my meditation, my safe spot, even though I'd done everything that I had been told to do. He was there. He was walking down the beach and he says, I'm going to introduce you to this lady. You know, there's some other events that happen. I just don't want to get into it too much right now. But, and uh, this Ving comes up to me. She looks a little bit like Medusa on the top, but it's just bangs. She doesn't have stakes. It's just bangs coming down. She's naked from the waist up. The bottom part's a spider, a black widow spider body. Yeah. And uh, this is what I call interdimensional bleed through because she says, give me your arm. And I'm shocked. I'm so at this point because I'm kind of naive as well. I'm thinking, how could somebody get into my sacred space? This is my space, right? How could they get into my space? She says, give me your arm. And I hold my arm up and she bites me and she puts two fang marks like right there. And when she does that, I feel it not just down in the lower world. My, I, I, it literally wakes me out of my meditation when I fling my arm back and uh, just about fall out of my chair. But I'm still managing to be able to hold it together to get back into that meditation. And so that was her way of being able to possess me, so to speak. And so there was there was an incident that happened where a couple of instances that happened where things were going on. And it was at that point, it's like you're looking inside your body, you're trapped inside your body. You're looking at these horrifying things that you're doing. I mean, they're not too horrifying. They're just despicable, being a despicable human being, right? And uh, you're trying to say, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. But something else is driving your body and your actions of your body. And you don't have any control over what may be happening at that particular point. And it was, it was getting that point where a year or two, it was a couple of years later, where there are two thoughts in my head. I would go into my head to meditate or something, and I'd hear something over here, and hear something over here. And it was always a conflict of, well, what is what, and how come I've got these thoughts going on? Two of them in my head. And it was basically her possessing my body in the process of doing what they call a hostile takeover. Uh, and it took a year's worth of shaman's work to be able to finally clear that. But a friend of mine helped me out a lot with that. She says, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send you an Indian warrior, and the Indian warrior will help you to you know, do a recovery process on this, which he did. He was very, very helpful. And uh, I had another friend who is a shaman. He lived down in New Mexico. 
And he says, well, we need to get this taken care of. So we finally were able to get rid of the entity. And when it did, it like triggered me back 24 years. 20 years, it was like, I was like 44 or 45 at the time. And it bounced me back to the age of 20. And there for about a week, I literally was living like I was when I was 20 years old. In fact, I had all these 8-track tapes I was scooping through trying to figure out why I can't find or play my 8-track tapes anymore. And I said, they should be able to play. Why am I going to even play this with, right? I go down to a place that I'd worked 20 years earlier and applied for an application for it. It was a welding position. I was a welder back then. And uh, I walk into the building. And I walk up there to fill out the application. I'm talking to the main supervisor. And uh, I say, yeah, I'd like to apply for this welding position. I worked for you not too long ago. You know, in my mind, I'm thinking, a couple months, right? And I uh, filled out the application. He said, well, how long ago did you work? I says, oh, I worked for Mark. And he was like, you know, my main foreman supervisor. And uh, so he looks back two years and says, not seeing anything here. And now I'm really kind of confused. And he, he's saying, no, let's go back five years. He goes back five years and says, are you sure you worked here? I said, yeah, I worked here like, you know, a couple of months ago. And so now he's going back farther and farther and farther. He gets back 10 years. and He's not finding me anywhere in the system. He goes back 15 years. Oh, here you are. Do you realize it was such and such a date that you were in? And I about just dropped him off. What are you talking about? Uh, you know, I, I don't I have no idea what you're talking about. It says, well, yeah, you work back here in such and such a day, like 1984 or something like that. This is, this is 2004. I'm thinking, no, no, that's not, you know, it's not the case. He says, yeah, he was. He says, Can you still weld? He says, yeah. He says, okay, come on back in for a test. I thought, okay. And I'm kind of stunned. I walk out the door. I walk down the hallway, and there's my whole foreman. He's sitting there, and he's bald. He had really long hair down to his shoulders, and he's bald. I recognize him. I said, Mark, what the hell happened to your hair? He says, oh, I shaved it. I grew it back. I shaved it. I grew it back, and I shaved it again. I like it shaved better than I did that way. I think, you did all that in two months? Because in my mind, that's literally what I'm thinking. It's just like, you know, and something was just way off. I was just way out of whack with the timeline. And... Um, for the next two weeks, I'm teetering on, they had the mental institutions up on the, up on the hill. You know, these were still before Governor, I mean, President Reagan decided that we didn't need those mental institutions anymore. And I'm thinking to myself, dude, do I need to check myself in? Because I couldn't figure out whether I was coming or going. I thought I was going crazy there for about two weeks. Yeah, I'm just trying to hold it together. In fact, they called me back after that two weeks. They called me back and said, okay, we're ready for you coming for a welding test. I said, what are you talking about? I don't want a welding test. Yeah. So something had tripped inside of me to set me back 20 years. And uh, fortunately, it returned whatever it was, but I don't know. Anyway, that's the shamanic side uh, of what a possession could look like. And I ran across another guy just a little while after that who had been possessed by what he referred to as a reptilian. And he went through virtually the same kind. When he got the reptilian removed, he went through virtually the same kind of thing that I went to. He lost his memory for a little while. you know, And it set him back a few years before he was able to recover and figure out what was going on. So there's something with the memory when these things latch onto you, these interdimensional beings. Now, there's a difference between that and having a full grown possession that just fully takes over your body and the Catholic priests come in and they say, hey, you know, you've got the four symptoms of possession and this is going to be a serious thing trying to get you rid of this. And they do the prayers and everything and like you'd see on the exorcist in the hospital, exorcist or something on TV. but. There are some more insidious ways that you can be possessed other than an outright take over the physical body. They take over your mind versus your physical body, which is 
totally different. So they're intelligent. They know what they're doing and they know how to work the ends. And it makes you wonder at times what is real as far as the UFO aspect goes and what is Memorex, so to speak. You know what I mean? So it could all our memories, the memories that we have inside of us are susceptible to trickery, I should say. Like I was tricked when I was had my experience when I was 24. You know, it's like, hey, you're being chased down the canyon by a herd of skunks and owls and deer, and those things are common as well. So how long did it take you to get rid of your attachment? Your attachment? It took me a year. And it was done by sure. Indian shamans? Uh, it was done by a shaman. He wasn't an Indian shaman, but it was done by a, a shaman. Yeah. So it was two shamans I had working on me, basically, to try to get rid of that. So what, kind of, what kind of shamans were they? Uh, he is practicing after, well, one of them was practicing after uh, Juan Castellano Costal, uh, techniques. And her mentor actually worked with Castellano. Custom, I can't remember his name right off the tongue's all time. He, he's wrote the books on it where he was doing the Aztec type of shamanism. More yeah. Or less. yeah. So they were both involved along that lines. Yeah. And uh, do you remember the day that you got rid of it? I don't remember the exact day, but I do remember the event. It was pretty powerful because I said, you know, I told him, I said, look, you're going into get rid of this thing because I want to help somehow. And so we both kind of journeyed in together to get rid of it, uh, which was successful, but he had his way of doing it. And there's something else that I was doing it that uh, showed up to help me. It was more of an angelic thing is what I had. It was like angels up in the four corners, blowing their horns down, trying to, you know, get the situation resolved and he had a different method he was doing where he was basically sprinkling it with uh, some sort of material I don't know what it was but we did get rid of it it was really tough so do you remember the difference between when you had it and uh, the first time you remember not having it afterwards oh yeah definitely my head cleared out that's what nearly drove me insane is because the minute it was gone, it was all of a sudden my head had been like, well, if you have a, like a bowl of milk and then all of a sudden the milk is gone, you just dump the milk out, it's gone, you just got something hollow in your head. It felt like that way. It felt like uh, the best way to describe it is I would think something, it would be like a thought would bounce around in my head. And that's the thing that nearly drove me crazy because I was now all alone with my thoughts. And before I was sharing it with this other being that had taken over possession. So when I was all alone, it, that's the thing that was hard to deal with. And I was wondering if I should not check myself in someplace because I was barely, barely maintaining it. So what's the, uh, after you got rid of it, uh, what was the next thing that happened to you? Uh, starts to get really crazy about that point because uh how do you know i'm uh probably 44 right around 44. i um uh, volunteered to well we had a move on conference i'd connected in with move on i found move on in salt lake and uh was friends with the lady who was dear friends when the lady was running it in Salt Lake at the time. And she had always invited me up to her house when there were major speakers that dropped into town. There was a gentleman dropped in who was heading up the Rachel UFO event down in Rachel, Nevada, which if you're not familiar with Rachel, it's a small little community just outside of Aerial 51, which basically it, it has an eatery, the little alien. 
Little Alien. Have you been there? No. Okay. At Little Alien, and there's a number of trailers off the side, and then there's a little tiny town hall, and then you have all your local community, which is basically farmers and ranchers out in the area that will drop in to keep it coming. And then the, all the tourists that drop in too. Okay, so we had a, he put on a conference every year down there for a while. It was not a guy by the name of Mike Bishop. It was a unique little conference. It was a lot of fun. We'd go down there. We'd go up to the gates in Area 51 and that kind of thing. And uh, But I met up with him at a MUFON meeting, okay? And at this MUFON meeting, we got together afterwards. We were just, you know, sitting around drinking coffee and talking. And he asked me if I'd like to come down to speak at this Area 51 conference. At first, I thought, nah, I'm not going to do it. So this is late at night, okay? This is like maybe 10.30 at night. And there's me, the director, Ike, and my friend. That's all that's at this meeting. That's just the four of us at this meeting. And um, we're about ready to go, and he says, Would, I'd like you to come down and speak at this. I said, no, nah, I don't think I want to. He says, yeah, come on down. It'd be fun, you know? Everybody kept prodding me. He said, yeah, you should go down. You should go down. You should go down. So finally, I relented. I said, OK, I'll come down. I'll speak at your meetup, at your meeting. You know? And it was a two-day event. It was a Saturday and a Sunday. And you would have, I think, there's probably about 10 speakers there. And one of them, the whole big man of the event, was uh, the guy who does he works in Vegas. He's a newscaster down there who does a lot of UFO stuff. Yeah, I know you're talking. Yeah, I can't remember. So it'll come to me sooner or later. And he was a, like the main speaker on the second day. So I was after him the second day, and I had a, a two-hour slot on the first day. And the next morning, I get up, and I go to work. I be there like about 7 o'clock, and I show up, and it basically it's a call center. And where we do sales for this call center, right? We're doing sales. And um, I'm taking phone calls, and all of a sudden, my computer screen starts glitching. You know, it starts going in and out. And uh, I'm getting a couple of kind of funny sexually in the windows calling in. It wasn't the regular calls that I was normally getting. So I thought, huh, something's going on with this computer. It's kind of weird. And it got worse and worse and worse until I got to the point where the computer just was flickering all over the place. And I was getting calls uh, from the LGBTQ community, basically. And guys were propositioning me and saying a whole bunch of horrid stuff over the phone. I'm thinking, this is not right. What the, what the hell is going on here, right? It's like I was crossed over with a sex line. I was getting all these really weird, crazy calls. So finally, I just shut the computer down. And I switched computers, figuring my line had got crossed. And so I jump on the next computer, and it does the same thing, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. And uh, I'm getting propositioned by everybody under the sun. I finally had to put my headphones off. I throw them out on the ground. I said, what the hell is going on here? Because now I'm just getting angry. And I close my eyes to do a little bit of a meditation. And the minute I do that, behind me, there's a portal that opens up, right? And in this portal is this great big lizard. I mean, he's a reptilian. He's very powerful looking. He's got the eyes that go up and down, the yellow eyes. He's got the, the green skin. He's got a tail that he's kind of propping himself up with. And uh, he's like about seven feet tall. He's a very menacing looking guy. And I turn around, even though I can see him without turning around, I turn around and uh, I'm looking at him. And I'm sitting in kind of off in the space all by myself, so this is not, you know, nobody knows what I'm doing. I'm looking at him, and he looks at me, and he hisses, and he says, don't speak. I'm thinking to myself, how in the hell does he even know I'm speaking? There were seven people that were, there are four people that were there. It's seven o'clock in the morning. Nobody knows about this event. Nobody, the only one knows the four people that were at the meeting last night, right? I said, that's nonsense. I'm speaking. I already committed to him. I'm going to go speak. He looked at me again. He says, don't speak. He 
gets a little bit louder, you know, he's hissing at me, you know, kind of getting agitated. He says, nonsense, I'm going to speak. And then I'm looking in the background and I'm seeing behind him, there's a man walking behind him. And he's holding a clipboard and he's got a buzz hair and a white robe on. And I, I'm getting the impression that this is a military dude, right? This is like an Air Force guy of some sort. He's, he, what? And I'm fascinated by it because I, now I realize that I'm looking into a cave someplace. This is the best to explore. You can tell the walls are just cave. They're, they're just pieces of the cave. You know, you can see the jets coming out and stuff. So it's unfinished, but it's a cave. And off to the right hand side, I look over there and I see even lockers lined up along the wall. And uh, I'm realizing that this guy is actually communicating this holographically from someplace underground, right? And uh, I stare at this guy, he's in the background, he's just copying something on this clipboard. He wasn't paying any attention to where he was at. And he just kind of walks by. And this reptilian guy looks at me and he says, and he knows that I'm not looking at him. I'm not paying any attention to him. And now he is really, really angry. And he's just kind of yells at me. He says, don't speak. I said, nonsense, get out of here. I'm going to go speak, you know. And the scene just folds up and it disappears. And I'm realizing that this is a holographic projection that they're projecting to me somehow, some way, from some military base, someplace, somewhere in the world. That's all I know, you know. But there's definitely a fixture of you got a military guy in the background, you got a reptilian right here. Somehow they're related because they're in the same space, you know. And so after I said, get out of here, I'm going to speak. It folded up, he left, and the computer went back to normal. The phone line went back to normal. I was able to continue on and do my work. But uh, something he was doing was interfering with the computer control, the frequencies, frequency modulation or something along the line. Yeah. So I said to myself, yeah, I'm going to go speak. So a month later, I'm down there speaking. And um, the first day goes really well. You know, there's a lot of people there, and uh, probably about 40 people there. And it goes really well. We're having a really good time. And yeah, I go to sleep that night, and I wake up this m next morning, and I can't see. My eyes are just like, I can't see. I can't see anything. I got my glasses on. I'm walking outside. I'm blind. I look at my pupils, and they're really, really huge. They're really big. And it's like somebody had taken the eye doctor had taken the drops and put them in my eyes and at that and to dilate them so that he could do his examination. There's that same kind of feel. <clears throat> well, we get home and we're going on the way home and there's a turnoff you can take just outside of Vegas where you can go over and hit I-15. It drives through a little town, you go over to I-15 on this other interstate road. And there's another way you can go home that is behind the mountains and you go around the long way and you go home that way. Now we were gonna go right, but the sign to go right wasn't there. It had disappeared, it was gone. There was no road. There was nothing going off to the right-hand side of the road. Not only with us, but with everybody else who came down from Salt Lake had to do the same thing because they drove right through where they were supposed to do the turnoff. The road wasn't there. You know, it's on the map, it's listed in the GPS, but the road wasn't there. You know, the sign was gone. It's like, so there's half a dozen of us that just totally missed that road. And so that was something else that I'd been shown in a vision earlier that uh, I would be going down there and I would be speaking, but we would have to take a different road back because there are some things that they wanted to show us. You know, so on the road back, there is a uh, old, off to the left-hand side on the side road, there is an old inn that's covered in antlers, like deer antlers and elk antlers and stuff like that. It was just covered with them off to the side. I saw that in the vision I had beforehand. And then down farther down the road, there's a Manti LaSalle Forest sign. I saw that sign. 
And then off to the side of that, there's a big old cave down to the side of that as well. That is where there's some sort of underground facility that they're using. And you'll see the fans up there, you know, do the fan work and that kind of thing. So it is showing that these noticeable things I was going to see on the way back to this conference. Anyway, back to the point I had before. <clears throat> During this conference, after the first night, and this is what I found out, after the first night of this conference, uh, everybody was sleeping in their trailers. It may have been about two or three in the morning. And then all of a sudden, the compound, the trailer complex just lights up. You know, and I'm kind of, I, I see the light shining through my window and I'm kind of groggy. Like I can't get the sleep out of my eyes. And I, I get up off of my bed and I crack the blinds open to look outside. And there's a military vehicle out there with a the big old, one of those big floodlights hanging up. It's a Jeep with a floodlight hanging out of it, right? And it is lighting up this whole area. There's a whole bunch of activity going on out there. And there's these men that are running around doing their thing, probably maybe about 10 men out there doing their thing with a couple of vehicles. And something told me to go back to sleep. So I just sank back down on the side of my bed and sat there for a minute and passed out. Yeah. And I wake up and I am in some sort of military facility. Okay, with this military facility, there is, it's just a typical small room, maybe about an eight by eight room. There's a door on one side, there are no windows. It's got the green asbestos, green, green and white speckled asbestos flooring, the tiles. <coughs> it's got a light green paint on the walls or brown, it might've been a brown paint on the walls, but it was, you know, typical military facility. I'm sitting in a chair like I am right now, off to each side of me, I can feel the presence of two individuals. You know, I'm taking it to the military police because I turn around to look and he straightens my head back around. He won't let me look behind me to see who's there. Okay. So I'm sitting there staring in front of me and there is a desk. It looks kind of like an old teacher's desk that you'd see back when you were a kid in grade school. You know, just an old kind of a wooden teacher's desk sitting there and a chair behind the desk. And I hear footsteps coming up the hallway. And in walks this guy that I saw behind this reptilian with this clipboard. And he comes walking by me. He sits down. He grabs a pencil out of his pocket, just a pencil. And he's tapping the eraser on the table. And he's looking down at the eraser and he's just not looking at me. He doesn't want to look. He doesn't, he's not looking at me for whatever reason. And he says, well, we told you not to speak, didn't we? And I just sat there and I didn't say anything. You know, he, he's tapped with us and says, well, didn't we? Didn't we tell you not to speak? We told you not to speak and yet you're down here speaking anyway. You know, and he knows he, he's not going to get any answer from me. He just keeps tapping on the table. And then I see another, hear another footsteps coming down the hall. And I see a guy, he, he's another military guy with a short buzz haircut. And they got... The, the same thing is they got the tie tucked into their shirt. It's not hanging down. It's just tucked into their shirt. So I'm thinking they're either Air Force or maybe Air Force, probably Air Force, what I can figure, because they've got a blue shirt on. He's got the white smock on and the, the buzz haircut, a tight collar. And um, this guy comes walking in. He looks about the same. He peeks around the corner. He doesn't look at me. He just peeks around the corner and says, sir, what should we do with him? So we chip him, and he looks back at him and says, no, nah, don't chip him. It's not going to work on a type like this. I have no idea why he said type like this, because I've been referred to that about three times, you know, type like this. So it's not going to work on a type like this. He says, well, what should we do with him, sir? He says, take him back. So then I feel the MPs grab me on the, under the shoulder, and they lift me up. And I start walking out and I walk around the corner. The minute I get around the corner, there's this little lizard guy in a smock of some sort. I don't know why he's wearing a smock. He's got a little bottle in his hand. And he goes, 
real fast and sprays it in my eyes really fast. I mean, it's just like super fast. I didn't even have time to blink. And I just crumple like log. I go down. And then I wake up the next morning. I'm in the trailer on my bed and I can't see. And my, even with my sunglasses on, I can't. You know, it's, I'm squinting. Everything is just really, really odd looking. It's really, really, really hard to see. And so what I'd like to do probably someday, if I'm up to it maybe, is find out what happened between the time they took me, escorted me out of my room and he sprayed my eyes to the time I went back into my bed. Because I'm really thinking that they probably inserted some sort of programming or something into me because they really did not want me to speak again. And the next morning, I have the speaker come out. Of, I mean, the producer, Ike, comes out. And he's talking to me. And there's just stuff that just pops out of my mouth randomly, round, blindly, before I catch myself. And I, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say that, you know, but it, just this horrible stuff come out of my mouth. And so whatever they programmed into me was for the idea that I don't speak. So it's just, uh, and that has followed me ever since. Up to the present time, I'm a little bit better off than I have been before because I'm speaking all over the place. And, you know, I think I've got a handle on on what they can actually do that that's it turned into a kind of a men in black situation after that okay i mean it's not your typical men in black where you see the guys with the sunglasses and the dark suits come up knocking at your door it's where the reptilian guys are working behind the scenes i know this is going to blow a lot of people away they say yeah he's eating, putting too much in his weedies or something you know but they're working behind the scenes interdimensionally to say hey nope you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that. And there are definitely ways that they can introduce themselves to you that will have you stop and do a second thought about life and say, hey, you know, watch it, we're watching you, you know, type of thing. Because they, they don't die the way that they have lives that are a lot longer than ours, and then they don't actually die, they just kind of transfer their souls into another body, you know. And they'll carry on through another body, so they have all the memories, and they continue without going with the, the fresh start. So they can live for lifetimes. So, what was your next experience after that? Oh, geez. How old were you? How old were you when you spoke at the Area 51 conference? It's probably about 46. Okay. 46. Go on to your next experience. Next experience kind of follows up on that because, like I said, they just kind of follow you. Um, they just have this way of being able to implant their will in you, if that's or influence, kind of remote influencing. So you know, there's this lady who decided she wanted to put me in one of her books. You know, she said, "Yeah, I'm going to put you in chapter one of one of her books right here." Okay, so. Uh, and that was the same time I, yeah, that was about, that was a little bit after that. So, still so going to put you in one of your books. I said, okay, you put me in one of your books. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. I said, this, this, and this may happen to you. I don't know. I can't be sure. I know what's going to happen to me if I do that. You know, but this is what's going to happen. And um, so she says, okay. You know, so I get together with her, right? And she writes a chapter of me in her book, which a lot of people have done that. It's not a big deal. I don't, you know, it's fine. She puts a chapter in the book. The next day, she sends me a copy and says it's been published. Here you go. Uh, my car mysteriously just breaks down on the freeway. It just like I'm driving down the freeway, fine, no problems, and the power just cuts off on it. Now the engine is running. Lights are working. I rev the engine up. You hear it go. There's no problems there. It just won't run. So I put it apart, put it in gear again, and it just takes off. I sat there for a half hour trying to get that thing working, and then all of a sudden it just took off again, just like that, just like boom. Um, 
I get evicted from my house from some outlandish story that somebody had told them that I was, you know, had been in prison and that I was a really bad dude and I was a narc dealer and uh, all this kind of stuff, which I'm not. I never have been. That has never been the case. And so, so they evict me from my place just the same day. My job tells me, I'm sorry, we're cutting back. We're no longer going to be needing you. And boom, I'm gone from there. So three events happen within a week. And that's usually how it happens. It's like boom, boom, boom. Stuff will just kind of boom. There you go. Yeah. So I called her back and said, look, I told you this was going to happen, didn't I? She said, yep. So they do have a way of being with it. So that's the dark side of uh, how dark it can get with some people, you know, especially if they got their legs on you and they'll say, hey, you know, you're a target. We're just going to target you. It makes no sense at all because you can be a farmer out in the field and they'll target you for whatever reason. You have a man in black show up because you have a crop circle on your property. You know, so don't talk about this. Why? There's no reason. Just they target you. One of the next, one of the really big ones that happened was um, a few years after that, I call it a praying mantis encounter up in the mountains in northeastern Utah, not far from Skinwalker Ranch. Okay, now this one right here was, um, we went up there, there are four of us that went up there, we're experiencers, we were asking to have something happen, right? We wanted to have some sort of an experience, and that's our whole purpose for going up there, we're saying, hey, you know, we just kind of send it out to the universe and says, come on, man, uh, make yourself known. And, uh, one of the guys, two, two of them were shamans, and two of, them were sh two of us were shamans in training. And uh, says, okay, this is what we'd like to happen, yada, yada, yada. Let's have something other than a human form come and get us, right? We didn't have any expectations after that. We just wanted to have an experience. Well, we get up there, and uh, it's a place where they have to have you have an outhouse, that's how you use a restroom out there. You know, they have no facilities, so you have to you actually have a double seated outhouse out there for whatever reason. And that's what you have to use if you need to go. And I'm looking out there and says, guys, stay away from the outhouse. Stay away from the outhouse. That's going to be trouble because that was after I had my, my stuff that went on, right? It's like, yeah, right. going to be trouble, dude. I was just joking. You know, I was just like, we're having a good laugh out of it. <clears throat> and we're sitting out there first night and there's another shaman guy who shows up and he says oh, come on over to the house and we'll do some stuff so we go over to the house and this is all like this part is just 100% shamanic but it interrelates to the experience that we have so um, he calls he runs up on the hill and he's chanting in a language that none of us really understand it's not like an Indian language or some sort but he didn't even know what it was and you can feel the wind come in, it comes in from the west, it comes in from the east, it comes in from the north, it comes in from the south. And he calls in the four directions and uh, creates a sacred space there for us. So we go back to the place that we're staying for the night. And uh, we see this, what we think is a moon, because the moon is a lot bigger than that with, when you're in the upper you know, in the high mountains, the moon looks a lot bigger. But this moon was really weird because it just hung over us all night long in the same spot and it moved. And we kept looking up at it going, yeah, look at that moon, man. Look at that moon. Is that moon something pretty? Right? So finally, we all get together. We go to sleep. We all decide we're going to go to sleep. We go to sleep. We wake up the next morning, ready to leave. We look over the mountain. The moon's going up over the mountains. And I look at it and say, oh, hey, there's the moon. Everybody just looks up and says, yeah, uh -huh. we don't put two and two together for whatever reason that the moon has been hanging out over us all night long. And yet the moon is rising up over the mountains that morning. And you can see it clearly. So how did that happen? Right. So it's probably not the moon. I think that was kind of a preparatory thing for what happened next. A uh, week later, we come back up again. It's a different group of us. There's four of us this time. We come back up and. Uh, Again, we're talking about 
wanting to meet something. We don't want it to be human because it's too, you meet a human, yeah, it's too plausible for everybody and they're not going to really believe that. It was as if they would believe it anyway. Right? So we're sitting on the front lawn. It's like 12 at night. We're drinking coffee, staring up at the stars. And all of a sudden, you know, it had been overcast when we first got going that night. You know, it had been sprinkling just a little bit. So the, it was overcast for the whole night. We go up there and we're going to look up at the stars, but there weren't any stars. And all of a sudden there were stars. And we look up in the sky and there's a perfect circle over us, like somebody had just taken a cookie cutter, cut a hole in the clouds, and we could see millions of stars hanging over our heads. And a couple of us had been stargazers, and, and we looked up there and said, we don't, I don't see any of the uh, normal signs you would see under a night sky like this. There's no, where's the little dipper? Where's the big dipper? We couldn't see any of the same signs up there. And the night had gotten kind of quiet. I mean, it, you could still hear some crickets and stuff, but it got eerily quiet. And we were sitting up there staring at as a little ship. You could see up in the air a little triangular ship kind of bouncing around inside the circle. And it would hit one side and bounce the other. And it was like it was clearing, keeping the clouds cleared out or something. I don't know. It's, that's the opinion that we got, what we had. And you could see this wonderful sky over our heads. And everybody was just kind of dazed and in a trance. And uh, then you hear running up and down, down the road, you hear some little things running up and down the road. Well, the lady said, well, we got to go use the restroom out back. She says, if we don't come back, come find us, right? We're again carrying on the joke about not going to the restroom. <clears throat> and I hear them all back that they're laughing. I can't understand what they're laughing about, you know, because Going, there's a little path going back in there. It's got rocks set to the side of it, and it's got cedar that leads back to the restroom. And um, we could hear him, the one of the shamans, I could hear him laughing back there, and we're like, what the hell is going on? Yeah. So he says, I'm going to go see. I said, I'm going to stare at the stars for a while, man, because I'm not all tranced out at the stars. He turns around, he walks back behind the trailer. And they're all laughing, and they're carrying on, and they're laughing, and they're having a good time. And they're yelling at me to come back, and I'm thinking, oh, I don't want to go back there. Man. I want to stay up here and stare at the stars. But eventually, I go back, and I see that they're sticking their hand over the side of the trail, and they're laughing. And what are you doing? She says, oh, it feels cold back there. Stick your hand out there. It feels cold, doesn't it? You know. So you stick your hand out there, and the moment I did, you could hear, and you could see all these praying mantis is running around in the backyard. There's like three of them. They're running around back there and they were chirping. They have this little unique chirp that they have. It's like a kind of like that. It's kind of like a that's how they're kind of echoing back and forth to each other where they're at, I would assume. And it was the temperature was about 15 degrees colder when you stuck your hand over the trail than if you when you put it over the trail, the edge of the trail, you can feel the temperature drop about 15 degrees. And I said, yeah, that is, that's pretty cool. And so we walk back around and we're talking about it and all of a sudden we're seeing these nine foot praying mantis beans. They got these great big red eyes and their head looks very much like a praying mantis. They got the wings sticking out that they're kind of using like, a, you know, fingers expenditures out there. And, um, They've got a long neck and they had a body that went into a mate. The neck led into a thorax type of a body that had these little fins underneath them that were kind of like gills. They had light feathers covering these gills. I guess it was for breathing, it would be my guess, a filtration system for breathing or something. And then they had four feet that looked kind of like deer, deer feet. And they were running up and down the road, you know, and uh, we just sat and watched it for a while. One of the ladies went out in front of the yard and says, well, I'm going to, there's one out there. I'm going to go out and see if I can talk to it, right? Because nobody was really scared of the whole thing. It was very surreal. She walks out there and we sat there and we watched her get lifted off the ground by about three feet. And then she was gently put back down on the ground and she walks back over. I said, what the hell happened there? She says, 
Oh, they lifted me up so I could see eye to eye with them. She says, I wanted to look into their eyes. And so they lifted me up. And she said, and yeah, that's just exactly what happened. They lifted her up and she looked right into their eyes. And like this was a real treat. And she set them back down. She walks back over the, the porch that we're all sitting on. And I think to myself at this time, well, I'm going to go back there and I'm going to have my thing going on too. So I want to go back and have them show themselves to me, you know, in full. Because you can see them running around. They look like shadows. And you can hear them. And you, you know, kind of understand that they were brushing from the brush and that kind of stuff. But, um, so I go back and I said, show yourself to me. And one of them pops up to the side of me and says, do you want to see me? I said, yeah, I'd like to see you. Said, you really want to see me? I said, yes. He says, nope. And he took off running. I'm thinking, God, that's kind of weird, right? And uh, so I go back around. I sit back at the trailer and we're watching the sky and the circle of the sky and, you know, seeing these things running up and down the road. Now there's like nine of them there and they're running up and down the road, which is significant. Nine is a significant number as well as three. And they're running up and down the road. I said, man, no, this isn't going to work. I want to see what they, I want to have them reveal themselves fully to me because I want to see what they fully look like. I want to really see what they look like. So I walked back around the back of the house again. And I said, okay, now, guys, show yourselves to me, please. We want to see what you look like. And again, he shows up next to me. You get the shadow thing showing up next to me. And he's standing there. And he says, do you want to see me? I said, yes, I really want to see all you guys. We want to see you. We all want to see you. He says, you really want to see me? I said, yes. And he stuck his arm, his little expenditure around his arm. I hung it over my shoulders. And the minute he did that, you could feel this blue. I guess the best way to describe it is like a blue electric, cool electrical energy just flow down my back. You know, just like, just kind of drip down my back, kind of this energy. And it just was really, really intense, but in a mellow sort of way, I should say. I, it's the best way to describe it. And uh, he says, not yet, you're not ready. And then he turns and he hauls off. And so we're all, I go back out front, we're all sitting there watching him run up and down the road. And then it just stops. You don't hear him running up and down the road anymore. And you can see the sky just kind of slowly start pulling in on itself. And the clouds come back and there's a little bit of drizzle. And um, back to normal. And we're all as normal as it can be. We're all just sitting there on the front porch. Just silent. We don't, nobody really knows what to say. I mean, what, what to say, what to do. We're just like finishing our coffee. So these you were manta, mantis beings? These were mantis beings, yep. What shape was their head and how big was it? Their head was like a regular mantis being, and it was probably, you know, I would guess maybe about three feet wide. And they had these big red eyes on them and the antenna coming out of their head and uh, this long neck. I've, I've actually got a picture up on it on my, I might have a picture of it on my blog site or I've got a picture of it on my Facebook page, but. They have a long neck that hooks into a thoracic type of body right there. And um, it's a short body. Oh, it's not one that goes out long like a real long mantis. It's kind of a short, stubby thing, but maybe about three feet long. And then they got the spindly legs, four spindly legs that come down. Okay, and then they got the arms that are like the regular mantis, but they're appended. They have like appendages on the end of them so they can kind of you know, do their thing a little bit. So, but they're very much like, I know a lot of people when they say mantis beings, they think of a human form with a mantis head on it and maybe some weird appendages. Yeah, this is not that at all. This is totally different. And uh, so we, we get this. So yeah. Oh, yeah, so we're sitting there, and then all of a sudden, out of the blue, all four of us say, it's bedtime, and we can't get to sleep fast enough. We clear everything off, and we all put it up in like about five minutes, and we're all jumping in bed. We're ready for bed. We're going to sleep. 
you know, it's like later on that night, they come by and they take each one of us one by one. Um, my experience is such that we were, they came for me and they got me and they walked me up a road that was going alongside the house into there's this big gully off the side of the road. And overhanging the, at the edge of the gully, there was a door that was there. It was like a portal that is looked like an old Roman or Greek Colosseum door. And uh, the door itself had up on top of it at the archway, there was like a clam shape. And the clam shape was lit up to be a bright pink. And I've seen that a couple of times before. It was bright pink. And um, it was kind of fuzzy. I mean, it wasn't fuzzy fuzzy. I mean, you could look through and you could see what was there, but it was like there's a film over the top of it somehow, you know, over the door. And he motioned me to walk in and I walk in and we're on this ship somewhere. Uh, so it goes right from being on the edge of the cliff to inside a ship. This ship is a triangular, it's one of the triangular ships. And they have, from each corner, they have a catwalk going into the center of the ship. Okay? In the center of the ship, they have this podium that stands about, it would stand right up about here to my chin, I guess. And on top of the podium, there's this little red ball, and depressed in the ball was a handprint. It was like that. It was made for somebody with three fingers. And I asked him what this was, and he looks at it, and he says, uh, deja vu, deja vu. I said, oh, okay. So I put my hand on it, and the minute I put my hand on it, there's a screen that folds open in front of me, up above me, and it shows me life events that are going to happen, I guess, so to speak. And they're scrolling across, and, and uh, we don't stay there for very long. And it, but if you look down underneath the, the, the pulpit itself, I guess is what you call it, there's a big orange ball that was hanging there. And that's the same ball that would hang off of a regular triangular ship that you see that orange ball right there, right above it is this podium. It's kind of like its energy source. And so we'll walk out from that. Uh, this is going to go on for just a little while longer. You get on it still? I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay. My earplugs just gone out on me. He charge it. Um, he takes me off to this side room. And on the side room, there's a door that's like maybe... 10 feet tall and three feet wide, and it's a black door. And we step up to it and it slides open. And he directs me inside and we go inside, we stand there. And as we're standing there, the door shuts behind us and there's this laser clear up on top in the corner between the ceiling and the wall. And it shines down on us and it's got like this purple laser and it just kind of scans my body goes over and scans it really well. And I look at him and say, well, what is this? What's this for? He's he's having a hard time trying to figure out what it is. And he's kind of like, like he's rubbing his chin trying to figure out what it is. And he's going, so, so, so. He says that three times real fast, like he's really excited that he's discovered what the word means, is so, right? It was for some sort of cleansing process so that we move on to with whatever your, your audio uh, has it changed quite a bit, and then it changed back, and then it uh, just as you reached out just now, it kind of muted a little bit. And um, keep talking. You still got me? Yeah. Okay. I just probably because I had my earbuds in, I had to charge them up. I put them back in the charger. Uh, so there's a side door that opens up to the left. And we walk into this room. And in this room, there is a kidney-shaped table on one side of the room. 
and there's like 26 people standing around. And if you count me, it'd be 27. Okay, and on top of it, there's like this little pyramid thing with four sides, big on the bottom, comes up to a point on the top, and in the top of it, there's this huge crystal ball. Now, if you look around the room, around the whole whole right side of the room is just wide open, <clears throat> like there's a big glass ceiling and a glass uh, wall right there. And you can see right out there, and you can see the universe out there that's floating around. It looks really cool. Yeah. And so we're sitting, I'm standing there watching this happen. And all of a sudden, you know, everybody's energy it's like your all their chakras lit up and these are not humans necessarily they're all types of different races it's like the chakras light up and you can see this energy shoot out of their bodies me included it jumps into this crystal ball everything swirls around together like now we're connected you know and then it shoots back up when we both get, all of us get our energies back at once. So there's that that went on. And then uh, I'm thinking that somehow we're connected somewhere. How many, <laughs> how many beings were there in the room? 27. 27. Which is a significant spiritual number. And what, uh, how many different types of beings were there? Oh, there are probably like four or five that I recognize. Most of them were human looking, but there are some that were not they're distinctly not there's kind of a dog-like creature there there was a can't remember everybody right off the bat of the head he stuck out there's i didn't really pay a lot of attention to that i was paying more attention to what was happening inside the globe you know? and then uh, that's done we're on top of the ship someplace i mean like very on the top of the peak and it's got a glass dome over us right and there's this glass dome over us. So he's standing next to me, and I'm looking out at the stars because, you know, it gives you a real bird's eye view of everything. Yeah. You know? And he looks at me and he says, Would you like to see? Of course, it's all telepathically. He said, Would you like to see? I said, Yeah, I'd love to see. And then everything disappeared. I'm floating by myself out in space. That's the appearance I got. It was just, just me and the universe out there. And I'm sitting there, and I can feel this. It's like a musical wave would be the best way to put it. It's, it's, um, it's a note. It's just kind of floating out there in the universe. And it, I can feel it going through my body, but it, and it's like it's touching every single cell in my body. But it's like um, if a breeze comes up and it blows through a curtain, you can feel the breeze and see the breeze blow through the curtain to an extent. If it's like a sheer lacy curtain or something, you can, you can tell it's blowing through the curtain. It's kind of like that. You could, it was like a wind was blowing right through me. And I could feel a note and like every cell in my body was just like buzzing really good for a second, you know, and I just sat out there and I, it was just like, you know, amazing. It was just, I don't know how to put it, man. I want to tear up right now because it was just really, really cool. And uh, I sat out there for a few minutes just kind of taking it all in, and then I'm back on the ship. And the next thing I remember, I'm in my bed. I'm waking up. And uh, I wake up, and for some reason, I slept with my socks on. I have no idea why. I don't, don't do that, but I slept with my socks on. And I look at that, they were sticking on the floor. So I look at them, they got cedar gum all over, cedar gum and needles all over the bottom of my socks and some of that clay dirt that was out there. You know, it's like a, it's a red dirt. It's out in that area. And uh, it was all over the bottom of my socks. So I knew I'd been out there and doing something. So that was probably, that experience right there was probably one of the highlights of my life, to be honest with you. I know nothing that would, uh, Rival S. Utah, right? Yeah, it's up. It was up in the desert. It's like a skull, stone skip away from uh, Skinwalker Ranch. 
right close to Duchesne. Utah next to Vernal. It's right up in that area. Okay. So yeah, and I have been to Skinwalker Ranch. I mean, not actually on the property because we couldn't get on the property, but you know, we've been out in that area and checked it out. So yep. So what's the next thing? Uh, so the when you when you went on the ship and you were with the 27 beings. It started with your shamanic work where you encountered the mantises, yes? Mm-hmm. Okay, yep. so make sure we're at the context back still. Okay, go ahead. Yep, that would be definitely a mantis all the way. You know, it's like, uh, I don't know if there's, like I said, there's never been anything in my life I've ever experienced like that. And you don't understand, it was like the energy you've been building up for, a whole week on that from our previous visit up there before. Uh, so there's definitely some sort of fine tuning that they did to be able to get us into that situation. So we have our experience. Oh, let's see. Next. Most mm. of stuff. There's a couple things I. <clears throat> Excuse me, get a little horse here. I really, they go really, really deep. I don't know how much I want to get involved with that because I don't know what kind of repercussions will come out of it. But um, it all has to do with uh, travels out of body. It's kind of a remote viewing thing, you know, places I started visiting. When you start getting into this consciousness sharing, this remote viewing type of stuff, then what happens is you you just get kind of fascinated with the ability to be able to just step out in the universe and do whatever, right? You don't really view yourself as having any real consequences to your actions because you're not at the time, I really didn't understand that anybody else could be in on this, you know? But I know now from verified sources that, yeah, the government and uh, certain agencies are well aware of people being able to step into their space when you're in that kind of a state. It's not just, hey, I can go out there and I can do what I want, you know. And I found this out from a sad experience here. Uh, let's see which one I want to talk about here. <clears throat> I set up, <clears throat> excuse me again, I set up a group. It was called um, the Encounters Group here in Portland, Oregon. You know, it's a meetup group. And we'd meet once a month and we'd get together and we'd just share stories and share experiences. And uh, there was a individual one time who showed up and shared his experiences about being an MP in, in uh, Germany that were quite interesting, but they're kind of personal for him. So I'm not going to get into that too good. But just to show that there are some government activities <clears throat> and that stuff going on, it didn't stop at the end of the remote viewing session, they just changed names and changed courses. Uh, so there was, I'll just give you this, I'm not gonna name names or share where this actually happened, but just say it's a top secret secure base that I probably shouldn't have been in, all right? I mean, it was just casual, innocent, hey, let's see what's going on there type of thing. Um, like I said, when I leave my body, I get up into a certain space, and I just check it out. I look around. And I say, okay, well, what's going on? You know, to gain my bearings. And then I just kind of, for a while there, I was just going out and doing my thing. Right? Just cruising around. That's kind of how the Mars thing came about was I said, okay, I'm going to go out. And I'm just going to see what's out. And this was one of those same things. I want to go out and see what's going on out there. So I saw a particular building that I thought was really cool that it would be neat to investigate because you know it's like put it this way it's kind of a national significance involved with it and um i said i'm gonna drop in there that looks cool man i'm gonna see what's going on in there you know so i drop in and i'm listening and i'm seeing what's going on and uh 
I wasn't there more than about five minutes and there's an individual who walks in from a different room and says, uh, guys, we got a bug. And I'm looking around and I'm thinking, he knows, he knows I'm here. You know, this wasn't that long ago, you know, and uh, he goes, he knows I'm here. And one of the guys looks at me and says, well, what do you plan on doing about it? He says, uh, we got it taken care of. We'll shoot a bullet at him. And I'm thinking, I don't know what that is, but it doesn't sound good. I'm going to take off. <laughs> and I don't know how they're shooting a bullet at me, but it's, I don't know how they're planning on doing that. They can't even see me, right? They're going to. So I take off. And I head straight up to the moon. I want to get as far away as I can from this particular situation. And um, what happens is when you do these travels or when you do anything out of your body, you leave, and this is a near death thing as well, but it's cut off in near death. You leave a trail, an energy trail, wherever you go that connects you back to your body. All right, it's there. Some people call it a silver lining. Uh, you know, whatever you want to call it, it's there that follows you around. <clears throat> it goes through, <clears throat> excuse me, it goes through space and time. And so I look back and I see that cord that I have has been trailing me. They've done a location on it and they sent, there's this, I look back at it and there's this little ball of energy traveling up this cord towards me. And now I'm really freaked out. I'm spooked. I'm thinking, okay, if this gets to me, what's it going to do? You know, is it going to scrabble your brain? Is it going to kill you? What? I don't know what the purpose of it does, but I'm not about ready to find out. So there are different techniques you develop to cover your tracks. <coughs> Excuse me. No, my mouth's getting right out that'll cover your tracks to prevent harm from coming to you. So I'm doing those things right there, trying to cover my tracks, prevent this from getting to me, you know, following my trail up to me. And it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. So I'm throwing barrier after barrier after barrier up. And finally, I just throw a huge barrier up and it gets halfway through the barrier and it stops. And I say, yeah, okay, well, you know, enough of just dropping into a place randomly. So. You get somebody who like maybe drops into Area 51 or decides they want to drop into the Kremlin or, or you know, White House or NSA or CIA or whatever it may be. You got to be really careful about that kind of travel because it's not necessarily going to work out. And if that doesn't work, if they don't do that, they send somebody up your trail, maybe an entity of some sort to uh, harass you about that as well. So, you know, that's a lot of they're a lot more sophisticated in that kind of work than you would like to believe, you know, and they could take a lot more different forms. Um, curses have been something that have been thrown at me a lot. You know, that's, I was busy communicating with a <clears throat> lady on the phone one time, and this was about, um, setting up services, phone service, internet service, that kind of thing for her. And we just got randomly talking about stuff while I was, you know, typing stuff into the computer. And she was a voodoo priestess from New Orleans who had been dislocated from the hurricane. And so we were talking about stuff. I said, oh, yeah, man, you know, I related to her how I thought something went down back in, you know, Pharaoh's day. And I got really, really quiet. She says, well, that wasn't funny. You know, that's, that's not funny. That hurt me. I was one of the slaves in that area, and you, you, you tortured me. You killed me. I'm thinking, wow, you're taking this really literal, aren't you? Yeah. And uh, she got really quiet. She hung up the phone and didn't think anything of it. Well, she said meant something about a curse, and so I walk outside at the end of the day, and I walk out of the creek, out of the apartment complex not apartment complex, but the office building, and I'm walking down the street, and there's a parking complex right there, and I get to the exit of the apartment complex, and I'm about ready to step in, and a car flies by me doing about 30 miles an hour up out of that exit with the intention of hitting me, and it missed me by about two inches, right? Literally, 
two inches. Okay. I get into the parking facility. I get my car. I get on my car and I drive them down the road. And as I'm driving down the road, a whole pile of cedar fences falls off a truck underneath my Jeep. And I'm bouncing over all these fence posts because I'm right behind it. And they're bouncing off my car and over my window and all that kind of stuff. You know, I'm thinking, good God, man, what, you know, I'm thinking, okay, well, what's going on here? And I get home, which is about a 30 mile drive. <clears throat> and I step out of my car and I'm about hit by another car. I go, okay, she's placed a curse on me. So it's a shaman, you do it and do your stuff and you release a curse. So these curses will start out as uh, maybe just a heaviness over your shoulders. You feel like you're catching a cold or something of that nature. And then as the day goes on, things, situations will get worse and worse and worse until boom, you know, a finality hits of some sort. And if it doesn't do it, well then it just hangs around worse until you can get rid of that and uh, expedite it. So that's, those are other instances that pop up that are quite <clears throat> interesting, I should say. Um, there was an incident, I spoke at the Seattle UFO Network here a little while ago. You know, uh, the organizer of the event met her up at, uh, what was it, Mount Shasta? It was up at uh, the ranch up there that does all the UFO stuff. You know, I ran into her. She said, hey, can you come and speak at our conference? I said, yeah, okay. Be happy to come and speak at your conference, right? You know? And this was when it was still very active with um, the don't speak phenomenon that was still going on, right? I don't know where they're at, but they kind of mellowed out a whole bunch and realized it's not working. So, And um, I said, yeah, okay, I'd be happy to come up and speak. And so I go up, I do my, speak, as, do my speaking gig, everything goes well. And I come back and I'm driving around and after about a week, you now I have this thing with my grandmother that happens every once in a while where I'll be driving down the road or walking along and all of a sudden I'll smell the fresh smell of roses, like fresh roses will pop up. And then my grandmother will speak in and she'll say something to me, you know, she'll give me some words of advice or something. Strangely enough, it's usually always about the UFO phenomenon. So here's a lady who's died, who's passed on, who's what I call the heaven kingdom, who's communicating to me about the UFO stuff, which I kind find kind of unusual, right? Kind of strange, but you know, that just show you how convoluted it all is, how it's all kind of tied together. She popped in as I was driving down the road. She says, hey, Don. And I said, hey, Grandma, what you doing? And she says, uh, well, I just wanted to drop you in to let you know that they're after you again. I said, what are you talking about? Really? This is ridiculous. Can't they just mellow it out? Because I'm tired of, you know, dealing with all this. She says, no, but I just want to know if you're aware you're going to be okay. I says, all right, thanks. We chatted for a couple of minutes, and she went on her way. You know, and the smell of roses disappears when she goes, so I know that's when she's like, you know, she's left the area. Um, so I was driving bus for a living, okay, and this is when it gets really weird. I wake up one morning, of course, it's not all, <clears throat> it's not all really weird anyway, right? I wake up in the morning, and, uh, I get ready for work and I get this heavy feeling like I'm catching a cold. Yeah, okay, catching a cold, it goes with the territory, you work on a bus. There's a lot of stuff that goes on with buses virus-wise, I probably just caught some of them pretty good, so. I'm driving down the road, you feel like it heavier and heavier and heavier and you feel the cold kind of setting in, but it never sets in. I get on the bus, I'm driving down the road again and you can feel it just kind of, feeling crappy and feeling miserable, but there's no cold develops. I think, oh, what the hell, you know? So I'm driving, the route goes away for about 15 miles. So I'm driving down the route and I'm thinking, oh, this is what she was talking about. You know, she said, be careful, they're after you again, you know? So, 
So I'm gonna go in and clear my energy out here after I get up on my break. But as I'm driving down the road, I pull off to the side into one of the transit centers and stay there for longer than what I should, maybe about 15 minutes longer than what I should, right? So I'm parked there for a minute, and that's where I come to the conclusion, yeah, I've got to get myself cleared off there doing their shit again, right? So I turn around and I drive up the road, and the very first stop that I come to that I'm supposed to pull over at, there's been a diesel that's ran into a semi that's ran into a US Postal Service truck right there at my stop that I'm supposed to be at, right? So how does that happen? I don't know. You know. So I go around the wreck, which I should have been there at the time. I go around the wreck. I drive up the road to the next stop. And there's two Persian guys, Mideastern guys, standing at the stop. They look like they're in a coma, right? They're just like sitting there with the sunglasses on, just kind of staring at me. I open the door up. The very first thing they say is, I don't believe in UFOs. I looked at him for a minute and I stepped back. I says, what? He says, I don't believe in UFOs. And now he's screaming at me. I don't believe in UFOs. And he takes a couple steps up to the bus. And he says, I said, well, maybe you should. And he's just screaming at me, no. And him and his friend do a comatose walk back to the bus. They sit down in the seat. They sit down. They stare straight ahead. And they don't say anything to anybody or look at anything. They just stare straight ahead for four more stops, and then I hear the bell ring, but they don't move their arms, and then they're only two getting off the bus, right? And they jump off the bus. I think, well, that's kind of bizarre, right? It's like, so I drive up the end of the line, and I have a few minutes, I do a shamanic clearing, I clear myself off, and I drive back out all the way to the other, and everything's sitting good, and I pick up a guy at the other end of the line, he's drunk, he's just skunk drunk, four sheets of the wind. He could barely stagger onto the bus, you know? I mean, he is just toasted. And that's not even exaggeration. And he comes back and he stands next to the wheel well, holding onto the rail. I'm thinking he's gonna lose it. He's gonna lose it, man. I'm gonna have to, he's gonna throw up all over the place. He's gonna pass out, something's gonna happen. Well, he does not We turn around and start driving down the street. And he tries to tell me something where he wants off and I can't understand a word he's saying because he's slurring really bad. So he's standing up there next to the wheel well, next to my driver's seat, and he's just kind of wobbling. And all of a sudden, he puts his head down, and he looks up, and he kind of gives me a look at the side of his mouth. And he says, I saw the accident. It was terrible. It was devastating. Oh, it was tragic, wasn't it? And he kind of smirked at me. And then he looks back down again and kind of shakes his head. And he's drunk again, right? Now, he was speaking coherently. I could hear everything he was saying. I'm looking at him out of the corner of my eye. I said, yeah, this is a freaky Twilight Zone stuff right here, right? It's really, this is a Rod Serling script. I mean, literally, yeah? And I take him up to the next stop. I open the doors, and he falls off the bus. Literally, he just falls out of the bus staggers up to his feet and bounces off my bus a couple times and runs over the other end of the sidewalk and falls down and collapses. That's how drunk he was. All right? The rest of the day went fine after that. Here's the thing. He didn't know where the accident was. He didn't know anything about the accident. He was drunk. He was sitting over here 20 miles away at the other side of town. Uh, these two guys I picked up right after this accident that happened had no idea either. They had no clue. They didn't know. That's only half of it. Within that week, there are five instances of stuff happening all in the same day in my circle. One, an emergency visit to the hospital. Two, a tragic car accident, which he may have been talking about, that almost killed two people, two friends of mine. Uh, three, my son was almost evicted from his apartment. Four, uh, what was the fourth one? Anyway, oh yeah, there was a couple of people that had a tragic accident that I was involved with that I was ready to do an interview with. Yeah. And so after that, I had to give it a break. I would say, you know, you know, I don't know what they're doing. I don't know how they're, they have a way of working through your energy or doing all this weird, freaky stuff. Now, this is something I have not told 
hardly anybody. I don't know why I'm spelling it out to you, but that's just some of the intrigue that goes on if you're working through that interdimensional sphere. You know, so somehow they still had a tag into me and they're patient and they work their ways, they do the thing. You know, so I, I did, I just backed off for a couple of years. I said, you know what, until I can figure this out and claim my energy, uh, they've, I, I, you know, got, so they make you feel like you're the victim. I mean, you're, you're, the, you're the abuser. So basically what I was hearing from them is, this would not have happened if you didn't make us do it. Yeah, that's basically the wording I got back from. This would not have happened if you did not make us do it. That's a typical domestic abuse thing. You made me do it, now I've got to do it because you didn't play by the rules. So it's been last three or four years on the fly and I've made problems with it. I managed to gain a hold on it and uh, say, nope, you don't get to do that. So, how far have we gotten in there? Um, well, that's probably a good ending right there. I'm thinking that's, uh, there's just demonic stuff and stuff that is going on for a while here that uh, I've been working with, clearings and that kind of thing. So, right now, everything is kind of just kind of mellowed out on the cruise. I've been picking up a whole bunch of speaking engagements. So, and I don't know how much of that you actually want to uh, put on the air, but that's it. Okay, so um, if I have you back in the future, um, how much more do you think you have to say uh, if we have a part two? Well, there's a whole bunch of kind of behind the scenes stuff that I don't know. I think that's probably about as deep as I want to go into it right now. It's so if if you're done for now, let me go ahead and end the show. Okay. Uh, it, it's been a pleasure having you on. Uh, is there? How do people get a hold of you if they want to reach you? Uh, I think you get a hold of me in my email address. Would be fine. It'd be d o n a a four four at msn dot com. They can always get a hold of me through my blog site of pathoftheshabala.com or my Facebook account. Okay. What was she email address again? D O N A A 44 at msn.com. Okay. And yeah. uh, is there anything you want to leave the audience with that? Uh, special message that is uh, or is anything that you yeah. have seen so far i've dealt with some pretty heavy stuff here and especially that last one which is heavy on the most part it has been you know i i, I did for whatever dwell on a little bit of a negative stuff but for the most part there's a lot of very very positive uplifting et stuff that's involved there you know in the beginning that praying madness thing like i say was just really intense. You do deal with angelic stuff sometimes, which is really cool. Um, so you you need to take hold of your power. And if you're walking around in fear of this event, the things that happen to you in your life with your events, you need to realize that you can take hold of your power and you can tell them, no, this is not going to take place right now. I am the one who's in charge. And they'll understand that and they'll back off, especially some of the, the darker entities. You just have to understand where your power lies and how to effectively take charge. So what do you tell what do you tell people who have attaching spirits? What would you tell those people? Oh, if you've got attaching spirits, especially with the drug demons, um, the, the drug demons literally will call you. And when people say, hey, the drug just talks to me, that is a typical drug demon sign. And I would seek to, uh, first off, treat it with probably some saging. Florida water works pretty good. 
Uh, you have Palo Alto sticks work really well, and just practice that on a on a basis. Your power lies within you centrally inside your soul. If you expand your power and spread it out and create your clear space, say, this is my space, and you don't have any right to be there, they may get angry, and you may be successful at that. If you are not successful at doing that, then you probably need to get a hold of somebody to see if they can assist you. It doesn't have to be me, it can be anybody out there. A shaman can do it, you can have, and they're not necessarily Native American shamans. There's a lot of shamans out there that aren't Native American, they're pretty good, just energy workers of some sort to give you a hand to help you out. Reach out to somebody. Anything else you want to say before we end the show? No, I had, thanks so much for having me on. Well, thanks, thanks very much for being on. Uh, yeah. Let me go ahead and stop the recording here. Hold on.